Good morning and welcome to the City Planning Commission public meeting. Madam Secretary, let's get going. Two thousand nineteen. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago? Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Here. Commissioner Bernie? Here. Commissioner Capelli? Here. Commissioner Cerullo? Here. Commissioner Delaus? Commissioner Dweck? Commissioner Edie, Commissioner Knight, Commissioner Levin. I'm here. <laughs> Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Commissioner Rampachet. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, November 13, 2019. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The minutes are adopted. Scheduling. Calendar number one has been laid over. Calendar numbers two through six, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, December 18, 2019, for a public hearing to be held at NYC City Planning Commission Hearing Room, Lower Concourse, 120 Broadway. On the resolution, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page seven. <clears throat> Borough of Staten Island, calendar number seven, CD 2N200024 ZAR, in the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 527 Ocean Terrace. For adoption on calendar number seven, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Bernie? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Knight? No. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz, I'm sorry, Commissioner Rappachet. Yes. Calendar number seven has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number eight, CD3 and 200038RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 43 Wards Point Avenue. For adoption on calendar number eight, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Bernie? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Rampershed? Yes. Calendar number eight has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page eight. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number nine, CD4, C190508, MMX. A public hearing in the matter of an application for an amendment to the city map concerning Bridge Park South <coughs> Mappin. It is a pleasure to welcome Linda McIntyre, formerly of City Planning, <laughs> in her new role representing the Parks Department. Good morning, Chair Lago, Commissioners, DCP. It's great to be here. Parks is seeking to demap portions of exterior and 171st streets and to map this and adjacent property as parkland in Bronx Community District 4. Just to fill you in on a little bit of history of parkland in this area, uh, park was uh, first uh, mapped here in 1895 as part of the George Washington Bridge project. But most of that parkland was demapped as part of the Major Deegan Expressway project in 1950. Since that time, uh, three uh, additional parcels were mapped as parkland, and this comprises the current bridge park north of the Hamilton Bridge. In 2011, TPL donated a half acre parcel north of the High Bridge uh, for use as an addition to Bridge Park. And in 2012, uh, DCAS transferred uh, the last remaining lot in that area uh, for use as this, for use for this addition. So this land, plus the uh, right of way that will be mapped uh, as part of this action, as you can see in the uh, gray area within the red outline there, uh, this is the subject of this application and this will comprise a 3.8 acre addition to Bridge Park that we call Bridge Park South. You saw the existing conditions at review session. Here's just a quick reminder. Uh, here's a portion of the 
exter exterior street right of way. <coughs> and another view of exterior streets. And you can see the grade change with the upland neighborhoods a little bit uh, there in that slide. And this is the portion of West 171st Street that uh, is requested to be demapped. And this is the current uh, south terminus of the Harlem River Greenway uh, in, on this part of the Harlem River <coughs> in the Bronx, looking southward toward the site. At review session, Vice Chairman Knuckles asked about the vision for this project. I did. <laughs> and as I'm sure he well knows, this community has been working for many years to extend and improve waterfront access on the Bronx side of the Harlem River, in part through the gradual building out of the Harlem River Greenway. Parks worked with the community coalition to complete a BOA step two report for the Harlem River waterfront, and this report was finalized in 2015. The Bridge Park South site comprises the majority of strategic site three described in that report. Parks has about five and a half million dollars in federal, state, and city funding to do some shoreline restoration work and extend the greenway. The project is currently in design with a concept expected early next year. When it's finished, it will be part of a continuous 1.3 mile stretch. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to continue answering the vice chair's question? Yeah, uh, it will be uh, extend the greenway for along the red uh, dashed line there, um, including the subject site, to be a, a 1.3 mile uh, continuous greenway starting at Roberto Clemente State Park to the north, which was uh, recently the subject of a fantastic renovation, which I recommend that everyone visit. Uh, so this project will, uh, to answer the vice chair's question, this project will advance the shared vision of more and better waterfront access on the Bronx side of the river. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Now that is the only person who has signed up to speak, but if anyone else is here and would be interested in speaking, now is the time. The public hearing is closed. Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 10 through 13. Calendar number 10, CD3, C2000061, ZSM. Calendar number 11, C2000061, A, ZSM. Calendar number 12, C2000064, ZMM. Calendar number 13, N200065ZRM. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments and for the grant of special permits concerning Go Broom Street development. Notice, a public hearing is being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above ULIP hearings to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. There will be a 10-minute presentation by an applicant team comprised of Wayne Ho, Daniel Hooperger, Simeon Mala, Elise Wagner, Brian Kelly, and Allison Ruddock. Uh, thank you to the commission. I'm Wayne Ho, President and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council. We're the largest Asian American social services provider in the country. And uh, the development project is going to be on a parking lot that we have owned for 37 years, located at Broom Street, surrounded by Norfolk and Suffolk Streets. Uh, this parking lot is uh, connected to our HUD 202 building, and it's been restricted uh, for the use only of the residents of a senior building. So as a nonprofit organization that is mostly government funded, we uh, initiated this project specifically because we wanted to make sure that we uh, utilize an asset that's A, currently underused. Secondly, we rent three properties uh, uh, to provide our social services in the Lower East Side, uh, and these leases are all coming up in the next year. And last but not least, uh, as a government funded uh, nonprofit, we get paid at best 80 cents on the dollar. So from this perspective, uh, we are continuing to be the landlord of this unused parking lot. Our co-applicant is the Gotham organization, and our mixed-use project we're presenting today, as you see, to summarize the benefits, uh, CPC will get a new 40,000 square foot headquarters in order for us to sustain our services for the 25,000 uh, diverse residents of Lower Manhattan that we will continue to serve. It will also bring mixed-income intergenerational housing. Uh, this includes 43% permanently affordable housing 
housing, including senior affordable housing at a deep skew of 53% AMI. Uh, additional benefits include the renovations of the BHH synagogue, uh, and we're rep they're represented today by ran by Greenbaum, um, as well as small format retail, not big box retail coming in to the neighborhood. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, we have many allies testifying today. For those who couldn't join, we have about 20 letters of support that's been submitted via email, including grassroots organizations, settlement houses, conservancy groups. Many of these groups are, are opposing other development projects in our neighborhood, but they've all banded together to support our project because they recognize all the community benefits that'll be brought together. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Daniel Huberger from Dadner Architects for the architects for this project. Uh, just to situate the project very quickly, it is bounded by Norfolk, Suffolk, Grand, and Broom Streets. It's located just south of the Essex Crossing development, which is currently under construction, just south of Delancey Street. This is an interesting area of the Lower East Side. It's where the 19th, 20th, and 21st uh, uh, century scales meet. Uh, those three scales are the traditional 19th century uh, iconic tenement uh, buildings. Uh, later on, the 20th century towers in the park developments south of Grand Street. And finally, and most recently, uh, the scale of the Essex Crossing development, which consists of a series of residential towers located atop uh, mixed-use commercial and retail bases. Uh, this project seeks to combine all of those three scales. In this exonometric, uh, looking uh, south, you can see that uh, the uh, general scale of our project is very much comparable to that of Essex Crossing. And even though it's not part of the Essex Crossing development, it's very much in sympathy uh, with it. Uh, one of the waivers that we're asking for is a height waiver. And you can see the tallest buildings at Essex Crossing are between 260 and 285 feet. And our building uh, will be modestly high. The tallest point in our building will be modestly higher at 310 feet. Perhaps the easiest way to describe this project is three, three streets and three scales. So on Suffolk, we have the lowest part of the base, which faces what will be a future uh, public school across the street and a public park along Grand. Turning around the corner to Broom Street, we have a street wall that mimics the height of the Essex Crossing base, and which has become the new datum for the neighborhood at 85 feet. That allows a maximum amount of light and air onto Broom Street, which will be a, a future shopping street uh, in the neighborhood. And then turning the corner again onto Norfolk, uh, we have a mid-rise building at 165 feet, which is a transitional scale uh, comparable to the NYCHA uh, building just across the street at 201 feet, and the Hongning Senior Residence, which is a little bit hidden in this exonometric, but you can see in this one, uh, at the corner of Norfolk and Grand Street. <clears throat> One of the goals of the Essex Crossing development was, was to have a diverse and active street fronts, and this project uh, is very much in that spirit. On Norfolk Street, uh, we, there will be a new uh, Jewish community center uh, uh, in the location of the former uh, Bed Hamidrash Hagadol Synagogue. Uh, next to that is the entrance to uh, the residential building on Suffolk, which will be senior housing. And then from corner to corner on Suffolk, uh, will be uh, small-scale uh, retail. Uh, th that entire length will be subdivided into, into several different uh, stores. Turning the corner uh, back onto Suffolk again, we have uh, the residential ent entry for the second uh, residential building on Suffolk Street. And next to that will be the uh, entrance to uh, the Chinese American Planning Council space. That entrance space will have the main uh, public spaces, multi-purpose rooms, and so forth that will greet the public. The CPC space, however, will the main, the bulk of it will be on the second and third floors and wraps the entire project from Suffolk Street all the way to Norfolk Street. One of the conditions that we have to deal with are the two existing buildings on our block, and that is uh, uh, Hang Nung, Hang Ning's senior housing at 50 Norfolk, uh, primarily 
which as you can see is a very long building, very a rather large building. It takes up half the length of the block, and it has been set back 15 feet from the street line, which pushes it deep into the center of the block. So we are looking for two waivers. One is a separation between that building and the Norfolk building. Uh, the, our Norfolk building is currently situated where the historic synagogue was on the lot line. Uh, those two buildings are on different properties. Uh, and there is also a, uh, uh, an egress from the Norfolk building onto, uh, from the Hungning building onto Norfolk Street, which has to be respected. Because the Norfolk building has been set back into the block, we are also asking for a waiver uh, of distance between buildings. Uh, the waiver we are asking for is 47 feet instead of the required 50 to 60 feet, depending on the window and wall condition. And uh, in the case of the Hung Ning building and the Suffolk building, we are asking for 12 feet instead of the required 40 feet between buildings on the same zoning lot. The experience at the street is very important for this project. So starting on the Suffolk side, you can see the base steps all the way down to three stories. Uh, there's the entrance to uh, CPC, which will be right across from the public park. We think of this side of the building as a little civic intersection between the presence of CPC, the public park, and the public school. And then the base goes up to the 85 feet datum of the Essex Crossing with retail from corner to corner. And you can see those double height windows. That is the bulk of the CPC uh, space. And so they will have a very identifiable presence on the street. And then turning around the corner back to Norfolk Street again, uh, you can see here uh, the BHH Synagogue. We will preserve uh, various artifacts from the existing building, which will be displayed in a public lobby, which will be visible from the street. And on the right-hand side, you can see the space in between the two buildings, which gives a glimpse of the interior courtyard, which will be landscaped for the residents of the project. <clears throat> uh, Good morning, my name is Simeon Mallow from Gotham Organization. Just in summary, just to note, the Chinese American Planning Council, which will remain owner of this site, um, this project supports ground lease payments to that organization to support ongoing community ser services, as well as benefits to their organization. Um, we're providing the 44,000 square feet for two important non-for-profits, both CPC and the BHH Synagogue on the Lower East Side. And additionally, there's approximately 488 total housing units to be provided, 43% of which will be permanently affordable, as mentioned with a deep skew average of 53%. That consists of the 115 permanently affordable independent residences for seniors in the Norfolk building, as Daniel described, at income levels between 30 and 80%. In the Suffolk building, 25% of that overall building at income levels of 40, 50, and 100% AMI. Just to compare that to a project that we've been compared to across the street, Essex Crossing is at 50% overall across the entire project. That's at an approximate average level of 80% AMI, and they have for sale condo in that unit, in that uh, development. Um, just to point out that both the Norfolk building and the Suffolk building will each have amenity spaces and outdoor spaces for the residents to enjoy. Uh, thank you very much. We welcome your questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Bernie. Um, thank you. C could you tell us what is the overall density in terms of people per acre or dwelling units per acre on the site after completion? This, the 488 units, we can run the math and report back with okay. the actual figure. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. Um, maybe pursuing something of Commissioner Bernie's line of thought, um, you know, the scale that's proposed here is um, daunting. Um, and you're asking for an upzoning to an R91. Uh, from the R98, the R98, uh, the R8 is consistent with what um, is present at Essex Crossing, which was certainly the result of a lot of um, planning and negotiation with the community to arrive at um, that as an appropriate level of density. Um, why do you need the increased density here? It looks like you're fitting. This is a constrained site for the reasons that you pointed out: the presence of the Hongning Building and the three to four Grand Street Building. So, you're. Um, trying to fit two um, 
or three or four or five different um, important components onto a relatively small site. Um, why, why are these buildings so big? Let's just put I, it in plain terms. From, from an from a economic perspective, this is a development where density creates uh, a public benefit for the greater good. Uh, the greater good being that it creates the level of affordability that Simeon had pointed out. For a private transaction with an arm's length between landlord and ground lessor and seller and buyer between the two sites, we're creating 208 permanently affordable homes in addition to 44,000 square feet of non-revenue producing community facility space to ensure two organizations can remain in the Lower East Side, remain sustainable and create and give services and access to culture as well. Um, a condition very hard nowadays when the fact of the matter is there's very little capital or subsidy to pay for those type of spaces and a community is only as good with the homes that you provide, but the services and access around it to create social equity. So in this case, we agree density, it should only be afforded when there's public benefit, and we think the degree of public benefit is very strong. Well, thank you for that fairly complete answer. Um, you know, I would point out, as, as Mr. Ho indicated, um, CPC has owned this property for 37 years, and I believe acquired it from, or, or the substantial piece of it, not the BA synagogue piece. Um, acquired it from the city at a pretty reduced price. So there is a there there is some subsidy available in the land cost in this transaction, and I wonder if that is playing a role in your planning and whether it might play more. I mean, just uh, I'll let them get into the finances of it, but I think to, to your immediate question and your previous one, I think one is while CPC did acquire the land uh, in order to develop our housing, and once again, it's 155 units at Hong Ning, it houses 210 seniors. Uh, the key thing to note is that for the last 37 years, CPC has been putting in our own resources to subsidize the building. So through our own fundraising and through the galas that we invite everyone to, we've been putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in order to make sure that this building uh, is safe, secure, and a, a good environment for our residents. Secondly, to the density question that you just asked, um, we have a unanimous support from all the residents of our senior housing at Hongning for this project. We've shown them the, the renderings, we've shown them the density, we've explained the purposes of this project, and all the residents there recognize that we need a building like this so that CPC can expand and sustain our services, and that more individuals who are low income, including other seniors, have an opportunity to have affordable housing. So CPC, we would not be supporting a project like this if it was is going to have a negative impact on our own senior residents at Hongning, but that's the reason why they're in support of this, as well as other community organizations. Including the folks who are gonna have the building wall, what is it, 47 feet? Whatever the, yes. whatever the waiver distance is from their yes. windows. Yes, and to, and to be here, once again, uh, the footprint of the BHH synagogue, uh, where we're gonna build up to, that waiver already exists. It's already built up where that is. If you're talking about the east phasing residence where there's gonna yeah. be the uh, other uh, building coming in, 100% unanimous support from all the residents at Hongning, and they've recognized the importance of losing a view is a trade-off in, in order for us to have such great benefits for other um, resident, low-income residents and for social services. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I had a yes, couple Commissioner more. I don't want to dominate here, but um, could you go back two slides to the image um, of the uh, Norfolk facade? On the right-hand side there, it looks like kind of a nice, um, that is gonna be the entrance into the center garden is really pretty narrow. I think it's what, 11 feet and a little bit um, on the plans. It looks quite generous in this image. Uh, and that also looks open to the public. Are you planning to make the center space open to the public? No, the center space will not be open to the public. Uh, what's shown on the rendering is accurate. It, it is in fact 11 feet. It's going to be landscaped nicely. Uh, that, in fact, is an existing egress path as well. So that uh, pathway that you see there with the two people, uh, the one in the red shirt standing on it, is an existing egress path from the Hongning building. Okay. Emergency egress path, which, which has entrance, to be. The side entrance, entrance that used to formally exist for BHH also has could you Could you actually path. speak into the microphone? Cor correct. So it is not only the emergency egress from the Hongning building, there was also a side path into the historic synagogue from that. Sorry, I was referring to your from, colleague from who had some additional information. 
to reiterate what Daniel had mentioned, the previous condition when the BHH wall existed also had that similar side access point. So it's a memorialization of the former access point as well as maintaining code required egress from Hongning. Okay. So you're going to be putting a fence up there, a gate? It, it, will, it will be gated, yes. Okay. But, I, but the gate could be open, it could be visible, you could see into the courtyard. But the courtyard is a private space which will be shared by all the residents of uh, the development. Okay, well, but I think that design detail would be important for us to understand um, because, uh, it, you know, it's going to be useful, important for the streetscape for this to, for pedestrians passing by, for this to be open, um, visually open, and, you know, some relief from the, Lots of buildings that's all around. Correct. I realize there's re there, there is some relief across the street on the NYCHA property where you have the playground across the street. Well, that is surrounded by a 10-foot wall. That's so surrounded by a pretty unpleasant wall. Yes, so exactly. If we can avoid that condition here, and both on the, there will be a Grand Street um, visual access point to the center garden as well, right? Correct. So I think I, I think in terms of landscaping, we can do that. So Hongning is set back about 15 feet. There's a landscape strip in front of it. Right. And the way we see it, that landscape strip would turn the corner into the courtyard space okay. visually. And so it would be seen as a prolongation of that space, which is not a publicly occupiable space. It's just an aesthetic. Right. Uh, but if it could be buffer. visually public. Um, Absolutely. So when, 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 I, to the when, when I say that is the intent. So okay. when we talk about a fence, it's for security, but visually it will be transparent. That's the idea. Um, and then could I ask about the um, housing program in the Norfolk Street building? Um, the slide you uh, showed for that shows. 70% um, studios, so, you know, a huge number of studios and then um, just one bedrooms. Um, and I think we are likely to hear some comment. We have heard it in the um, borough president's recommendation that that um, unit mix may not match the needs of the population. Obviously, CPC understands this population very well. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you settled on that allocation of unit size? So we, by working with CPC, who will be our joint venture partner in the senior housing building so that they can provide the services and they do understand the senior population in coordination with them, as well as other senior housing not-for-profit developers we've worked with, we've included a component of one bedrooms to uh, address the fact that some seniors may have atypical household formations, but to maximize access equity and the number of seniors we can address, traditionally have uh, focused on creating the most number of units by having most of them be seniors, but have the set aside of a certain number of units, including one bedrooms, which is still a profound number of 35 uh, one bedroom units to make sure that um, whether husband and wife desire to uh, have a one bedroom versus a studio and can afford it, um, or separately if they have a grandchild with them and they need a little more space because it's an atypical household, that one bedroom accommodates it. But we found that the traditional senior household formation, especially as they're downsizing and based on their limited income, the studios <coughs> tend to be the sweet spot. Okay. And then, um, if I may, to your last question too about uh, the, the guard in the middle. Uh, in order for the, to protect the safety as well as confidentiality of not only our senior residents, but also uh, through our social services, we do serve individuals who are immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, as well as individuals who are living with HIV AIDS, who through our other government contracts, as well as just best practices and social services, we wanna maintain safety and confidentiality. And that's part of the other reason why we wanna maintain the privacy um, of the middle courtyard. Other questions? Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, I, I note that you have a fairly broad distribution regarding AMI. I'm wondering, uh, what is the AMI for the uh, community board in which this is, uh, project will be located? Anybody know what the local AMI is? Ken, the exact statistics, I'd, if I can report back in writing, because I just don't want to misquote the exact figures, but we can report back with the other question as well. Thank uh, you. We've, working with HPD, we followed on the citywide metropolitan area median income, which is their standard for creating the average AMIs and the income beds. Mr. Bernie. Um, sorry, just one more thing, and I know it's in the documentation, but if you could just remind me, um, on Suffolk, which is a narrow street, we have a 310-foot tower. So what is the street wall and setback um, on that street? <clears throat> so the, uh, the, the street wall there is the lowest of all the streets. Uh, it's facing, uh, if, if you can, actually. 
So uh, the street wall here goes to its lowest height, uh, which is three stories. I forget the exact height. I would say it's around 45 feet. Uh, and in order to, to maximize the distance between the Hongning building and the Suffolk uh, high rise, we are also requesting a waiver in the street wall setback. We have a street wall setback. It's 10 feet instead of the customary 15 feet. Even though this is a narrow street, we have to keep in mind that on the other side of the street is going to be a relatively low rise building. There's a lot which has been designated for future public school, which I assume is going to be in the range of 70 to 80 feet maximum. Um, and there is a public park along Broome Street, so there's a, there is a, an open space. Thank you. Other questions? I wonder if the applicant team is aware of other buildings of this density, this height, that are located within 12 feet of each other. That would be quite helpful to get other examples. Obviously not on the spot, but as follow-up to the commission. Okay, we will provide that in writing. Thank you. Other questions? Well then, thank you to the applicant team. We will now be hearing testimony from the public and we will follow our standard procedure of having five speakers in opposition, five speakers in support, and go back and forth this way until all who want to be heard on the subject have been. And I'll reiterate that each speaker will have three minutes. Speakers who are using a translator will be accorded five minutes. Our first speaker is Judith Pregall. To members of the commission, I am here to oppose a change in zoning from R8 to R9-1 for this Broome Street development. This site is just across from the new Essex Crossing development, which was very carefully planned. This new Suffolk building with a 310-foot roof line height would be 25 feet taller than the highest Essex Crossing building at 285 feet and would be two and a half times higher than presently allowed. And it could go even 30 feet higher with the planned roof mechanicals. This applicant also wants special permits for fewer setbacks, street wall changes, minimum distance between buildings, and despite stringent zoning rules to build on narrow streets, this building, on a fairly restrained footprint with but two narrow cross streets. There would be no outdoor space. The totality of all these requests just emphasizes that it is too much for this site. This applicant notes that these changes are necessary for the viability of the project so it can accommodate affordable housing and community spaces. These are commendable, but this is not the place to put them. Yes, affordable senior housing is a desirable amenity, but our neighborhood already has a large share of this in a dedicated Essex Crossing building, in another one growing, going up on Essex Street, and in other properties in the vicinity. Community space is also commendable, but 40,000 square feet, I mean, how many apartments is that? It seems excessive. Unfortunately, the borough president's report approving this application was not sent to the public until yesterday. That vote to allow this makes short shrift of all the points that I've raised here. There are dozens of sites in this neighborhood that could be ripe for development. Is every developer going to be allowed to build higher and wider for more affordable apartments? Will every one of the many social service agencies here get new spacious office space? What will our neighborhood look like? What is zoning for, if not for something like this? I was hoping that someone somewhere in some place of authority, maybe here, would be able to see the failings of this proposal 
and not approve something that looks, can I go another minute, please? No, I'm afraid not. We limit our speakers to three minutes. Um, any questions from the commission? If you want to submit for your thing. Excuse right. me? Oh yeah, we would very much welcome your written submission, either now or following the hearing. I was just going to say this building will be here for 100 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Jerry Kolber. Hey guys, I'm Jerry. Um, I'm a resident of the Lower East Side. Um, first of all, I just want to say to all of you uh, what an amazing job you did with Essex Crossing. Uh, it was the result of a lot of community input and consideration, and it works. Um, it works really well, and I know you all had a very tough job and a sometimes thankless job, and we appreciate it. I also want to say as a resident that I welcome these developers and the Chinese Planning Council uh, into the neighborhood. The issue we have is, is sort of echoing uh, Judy who just spoke, which is just really a question of scale. Uh, it's a neighborhood where just across the street, uh, Seward Park actually voted no to receiving $52 million for, for air rights from a developer just last year. Uh, because the entire community of Seward Park, which is many thousands of people, uh, just didn't want another giant building going in when we had Essex Crossing already there. Uh, we'd like to see this building built in a way that represents the scale and character of the neighborhood. Uh, we, we believe that it can be done uh, without all of these waivers. Um, quick question for you guys. Is it possible to pull up a slide from the earlier presentation, slide five, if I could. Um, Finally, if you could keep speaking, the tech folks sure. are, we'll pull it up. <laughs> Background stuff happening. Um, so I'm a, I'm a business guy, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, I, I make TV shows, and so I'm always working in the constraints of schedules and budgets. And there seems to have been an assumption made with this project that, uh, and, and to be honest, I don't understand how the entire process works, but it seems like there was an assumption made that the R9 zoning would happen um, because there was never a plan proposed uh, that, that showed how this would work if it respected the R8 zoning. And all I just want to point out here is <clears throat> if you look at, you know, we're talking about the 85 foot as the, the, the new sort of standard for setbacks, but if you look at where uh, most of the buildings are that have the, those setbacks, uh, sorry, not set, the, uh, the, the building height, there's also setbacks, right? So there is, they're, they're all sort of, uh, you know, 20 or 30 feet back from the street. Uh, this building is the only building that is going to go uh, right up to the curb line on four one-way streets. If you look at like the other buildings, they're on the corner of Delancey, you know, they're on Essex, so they're on, they're on much wider streets. So what you have happening here is just kind of a, a monolith, uh, really. And it just, it's just concerning for us because it's gonna be there for a long time. And we want, it, we want to see this community, uh, community center there, we wanna see the affordable housing, but we'd like to see it done in a way that just slightly reduces and respects the scale of the neighborhood. Thank you guys. Thank you. I wanna thank you for thanking us. Oh, it's a pleasure, sure. but I think <laughs> equally important with respect to Essex Crossing is to recognize the role of the community, how active and engaged, and I do think the quality of the project um, reflects the significant years of community engagement. Commissioner Levin, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you for your um, thoughtful comments here. Um, I too was frustrated by the fact that the environmental impact statement doesn't include any indication of what might be built at an R8 scale, and the reason for that um, as you know, they, they, they did this according to the rules for preparing an EIS. There are so many restrictions on that land already that the as of right scenario under doesn't even allow any building under R8, so they didn't show us that. I too would have liked to see what an R8 scale might produce here. Um, but I guess I'd ask, so, so uh, there is by no means an assumption that the R91 is going to happen. That is, in fact, the point of this hearing okay. um, to consider whether or not we should um, recommend, a, we should approve that zoning designation. Um, but you indicated a, you know, enthusiasm for seeing this kind of a program developed. Indicated it was a question of scale. Um, 
Do you have a concrete suggestion for what kind of scale would be appropriate on this site? How much of a height reduction? I assume we're talking about a height reduction and a few yeah. square feet. What do you want? So we'd like to see this building at the same height as the surrounding Essex Crossing, which is typically, I believe it's 18 to 20 stories. So uh, we're looking at, again, I'm not an architect, but uh, you know, 200 to 250 feet. Okay. You know, there's a, the other, the biggest issue also, the, the other big issue is just how close this building comes to the sidewalk on every side and also takes all of that open space and consolidates it inside. Right. Um, may I ask one question? No, I'm uh, afraid the okay. questions come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only, the nice only issue was just CPC is going from being a renter of a lot of space to actually being a landlord, which just raises the question as to why they can't, you know, why, why is that a financial issue, a burden for them? since they, they're going to own the land rather than be renting all of their space. So, other any, questions any other questions? for Mr. Colbert? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate the work you guys do. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Marion Rydell. Good morning, and thank you for um, taking the time to hear us all on this. I'm speaking in opposition to this development as planned. I think there's a reason why our neighborhood is zoned as an R8, and that has to do with some of the things that have already been raised. We have small, narrow, one-way streets. We have a huge development in process, the Essex Crossing, which all of you and all of the community spent many years getting right. And while you know nothing's perfect, it's pretty right. And as it is, um, our traffic, our foot traffic, the pedestrian, the subways are not really keeping up with what's happening in the building. So this building adds just another stressor. Um, and it's, I also, as other people had said, would be more willing to support it if it were an R8 and if they were not asking for all the setback variances that they're asking for. Um, by the way, the um, average AMI is the last time I looked for our neighborhoods, $37,560. New York City is $93,900. I don't have a computer with me, a calculator, but I'm pretty sure that even with the percentages that the developers are talking about, we're not talking about a lot of, of affordable housing for the people who live in our zip code, um, many of whom have been pushed out because of the development. Um, uh, just a few other points. This project has been very rushed, unlike the Essex Crossing process. And um, in fact, there was a terrible accident a few weeks ago in which one construction worker was injured and another was killed. Now, I don't have, I'm, I'm not a builder, but I think that with more thoughtful movement forward, we could have avoided that and might continue to avoid other things that will negatively impact our neighborhood. Um, I invite you all to try to cross Grand Street at Clinton and see what crossing is like. I'm quite sure we're gonna have other problems there. And if we have more construction and more development, we're gonna see more of those. I am not against the development. I am against the development with the zoning change and with the, all the variances that are being requested. The, a setback of 10 feet on a street as small as Suffolk is just untenable. There will be no light, there will be no air, there will be nothing but shade, and there will be no room for accidents for, for any kind of um, flexibility should there be a problem with, um, with traffic. Um, the, so, I'm sorry. I think that's really, oh, the lack of community outdoor space. Again, we're looking at a, a neighborhood that has, we have a very small community outdoor space that's part of Essex Crossing. It's all concrete. It's really not very um, inviting to community members. So here we're gonna have some outdoor space that has some landscaping, but it will be gated off to community members. And I just think that they could have um, invited the community in, in more ways that would have made us more supportive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Eady. Thank you very much. Um, I guess one question I have is just relating to the scale of the building people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Is it the height of the buildings that people are concerned about or the density that's being proposed for the site? It's both. So the R9 has to do with height and density and then the lack of setback. So that, you know, it's very nice they showed a picture of, well, on Suffolk Street will only be, the front will only be three stories. But behind those three stories is a very dense and very high building. Um, so I like that, you know, there's that 
three-story setback, but it's insufficient for what the neighborhood calls for. Like I said, you all and many like you have worked very hard to make zoning in particular neighborhoods because of what those communities look like, because of what's feasible in those communities. While Manhattan and New York City is growing at a pretty um, incredible rate, I, I don't think, unless we really have a thoughtful process of relooking at those zoning, that we should just be giving variances to zoning um, and, and just throw out all those years and careful thought of, about why they were there. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker will be William Ferris. It's Ferns. Oh, Ferns. That's okay. My, my printing is terrible. I, One of I, my biggest challenges is the handwriting. I, I, I flunked penmanship in grammar school. So. Uh, First of all, I want to apologize. I'm going to have to leave before the end of the meeting. I like to usually stay at the end, but I have a Christmas caroling gig in Industry City. I, I'm a musician. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it brief because my colleagues have said a lot of our objections. Uh, the main concern is, as you mentioned, Essex Crossing took years with a lot of public input. This has been pretty much rushed through. I mean, we're really talking about it, it, it didn't even get on the community's radar for most of it. I know the community board had it on its schedule, but a lot of the meetings happened, a couple of meetings happened over the summer, uh, really didn't get on our, our radar till a few months ago. So it's, we're really concerned about the rush. Uh, we are also concerned, I'm not sure if people actually put numbers to the scale. The R8 housing gives them about, uh, it's, a, it's I guess what they call a six point something FAR. So it gives them about 180,000 square feet of buildable uh, footage if uh, they kept within that, with all the square footage they have, including the synagogue and everything. With the R9, it would get them to about 270,000, because that goes up to a nine FAR. Now, this is what I've learned from the web, you know, so you, you all know more than me. I'm just, I just know how to read. Uh, so what they're asking for is about 170,000 square feet in variances. That's the size of the current zoning, basically. They're asking for a huge number of variants. Every possible variance, I think, I guess that is allowable, they're asking for. It's successive. I mean, we're not talking about incremental change. We're talking about an order of magnitude of changing, not only the zoning, which would be one issue, as Jerry mentioned, but also all the variances. It's, I don't think that this was really within the, uh, the original plans of the zoning to have this big a scale. So that's our, my, just wanted to impress on that. And again, as my colleagues have said, we thank you for the work, especially I live right across the street from Exit Crossing. It blocked my view of uh, the Empire State Building and I lost the house that Sonny Rollins used to live in when he wrote uh, his first couple albums. But it still uh, has turned out to be a pretty pleasant environment. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ferns. And questions? You can get off to oh, your gig. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Nora Breen. Hi, panel. Thank you for your time. And again, like my colleagues and neighbors have said, you know, for the work you've done on Essex Crossing, I live on Suffolk Street, and I was really nervous about Essex Crossing and all of the construction. And at a lot of the meetings I went to, people would say it's just a parking lot. Parking lots help the small businesses in our neighborhood do business. Without parking lots, many, many people went out of business because they had no affordable place to leave their vehicle. And so these these things are important. These are not small things in a community. This building is gigantic. In the renderings, it looks very sweet, but when you look at the drawings from every side, which I've done many times because I've been to a lot of these meetings, it is just a behemoth in the middle of a what was a very residential neighborhood. I live right on Suffolk. I will lose, and we will all lose, just a gigantic eye line of this building, and we really do wonder why, as Bill said, all of these variances are being asked for, almost 200,000 square feet, more than is allowable. That I just, I don't understand. Going to the CB3 meetings, I will say that they have re expressed remorse in recent days that they didn't have all the information when they first approved this building in September. We had our first meeting, they reached out to the Suffolk Street Block Association in July and said that they would meet us again. They 
they sent an intern to meet us and she couldn't answer the questions. And as my friend Miriam pointed out too, that the, that the presenter doesn't even know the AMI of the neighborhood. It's like, it's this project is really being pushed through. There does not seem to be a very thoughtful, the lack of setbacks is going to be, is everybody said walking around there, I'm a bike rider, it's so dangerous around there right now. It is really, really, really a mess over there. And this, I can't even imagine going through this again with a gigantic building. And the last thing I'll say is, as the project, as the CPC said, and we support them, 80 cents of their operating, 80 cents to the dollar of their operating funds come from the taxpayer. The land was gifted to them at a very low price from the taxpayer. This project will receive a 20-year tax abatement for being in a partnership with a not-for-profit. That means no infrastructure help to our neighborhood from a yet another construction project, a huge development. So I would, I'm very exhausted by this idea. Thank you, Ms. Breen. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Elsa Pereira. I'm for this project. Yes. Okay. We just uh, go five against, five for, and you're the okay. first Hello. one for. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the project. Um, my name is Elsa Pereira. I'm the Managing Director of Operations for Grand Street Settlement. We're a historic settlement house that's been serving the Lower East Side since 1916. And like our sister settlement house partners at CPC, we're committed to providing high quality affordable housing and social services. And like our partners at CPC, we have an established history of advocating for our Lower East Side neighbors. We believe the Broom Street project will benefit our neighborhood, particularly our lowest income residents. The project will enable mission-driven institutions with deep roots in our neighborhood, like Grand Street Settlement, like CPC, and like Beth Hamadrash Hagadol Synagogue, to stay here and continue serving our neighbors. Grand Street Settlement's own experience with rapid growth in the neighborhood most recently culminated with our status as a community partner at Essex Crossing at our Essex Crossing um, Community Center, which is at Site 6, which is the uh, low-income senior housing building, the Fran Golden Building. Um, it's down the street from the CPC project. We provide culturally competent supportive services and nutritional, educational, and recreational intergenerational, as well as senior-specific programs. We also run child care and youth programs at Seward Park Extension, so we are a neighbor. We're all over the neighborhood. And we look forward to extending these programs and services for free to our new neighbors residing in CPC's Broom Street development. Like Essex Crossing, we know that the Broom Street Development Project is the result of a thorough pl planning process that sought to maximize the number of affordable housing units. We recognize that there was a lot of effort put into engaging a diverse group of neighborhood stakeholders. In our experience, the long-term benefits of this type of project far outweigh the short-term inconveniences. As many of the low-income seniors in our residential building, as well as the dozens of young people who have graduated from our job training program at Grand Low Cafe at 168 Broom, um, down the street can attest, this project is a welcome addition to the neighborhood and has enriched and in fact completely changed the trajectory of their lives for the better. Grand Street Settlement knows there's strength in alliances and we're excited to work, to, uh, work together to better serve our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Can I? And if you'd like to submit, um, yep. for anyone who would like to submit their written testimony, they can give it to the secretary. Okay. Our next speaker will be Yu Zhu Shang, and he will be speaking through a translator. Dajia 
，然后这个时候有一份报纸呢，我看到一份报纸里面一个信息，给我一个提示，我就是这样认识的那个 C B T C P C C P C 那个陈小姐，是她帮助了我，然后呢，她嗯在。介绍我到那个 CPT 那个老人中心去，然后经过那一段时间接触，我呢很爱上这个 CPT， 因为在这里我学到了很多很多东西，在这里我也认识了许多长者中心的长者朋友，从此我我也爱上，几乎我每天都来到这里，这里的工作人员和志愿者呢，很认真，也很细心的。关心着我们长者的身心健康，所以呢，我在这里呢也学到很多。这里有办各种学习班，因为实际因为地方太小了，学习班呢只能分批，有的人要等待。我我在那里也学到很多东西，我在那里学画画，画画、唱歌也是我的最爱。我在那里也很开心。我我从此以后，我病也少了。我本来很多病嘛。现在我我开心的很多，所以呢，现在呢，也有很多外面的那个老年朋友也想进入这个地方，但是那里地方又太小了，所以我也觉得很可惜，这没办法。然后呢，我在那里也经过那个那里的那个陆景老师的帮助，我也成为很自豪的跟你们说，我也成为了美国的公民。我现在也很自豪的加入了你们，我们美国的那选举的那个行业，行业。虽然呢 ，C P T 是很好，但地方太小了，因为有很多人有参加这个地方，我也觉得很可惜，不能容纳更多的需要帮助的长者朋友。今天呢，我主要是想大让大家知道，社区和社区和长者是多么需要 c p d 这个这个这样呢，真心的、实在的帮助我们大家服务的机构，也是我们期待有关部门能够为我们长者提供可以负担起的住房，这将是我们最大的福音。因为呢，长者负担的顾虑最多的是有一个固定的可负担起的住处。希望你们继续支持 c p c 长者的住房和长者服务，非常非常谢谢大家。Um, hi, hello everyone. My name is Ling. Um, the senior who just did the testimony, she used the whole language Mandarin, so I'm gonna translate briefly in the English. So the Person name, uh, the scene name is Yu Zhu Zhen. She's about 65 years old, and she's one of our senior service uh, member. And this, um, the the story about her is in 2003. She's the first time immigrant to the United States. She was uh suffer from poor living condition and as long as well the language barrier. She's got a very frustrated depression. So at that moment, she just find out the newspaper where she can looking for the services to help her and her family. So this newspaper is showing the CBC Chinese American Planning Council where it can provide direct mental health services and housing support as well. So the next day she looking for us and we provide them resources. We help them fill out the form. But as everyone knows, the senior housing is going to be long waiting list. So she's still hoping she can get a one day she have her own place. But same time, she join our service every day because this the place is <coughs> better than she think is no place to go. This place provides service and recreation, educational activity every day to the seniors, which is CPC that for um, not only one member and so many members. So the points from her but speech. Terry, the time has expired. Okay. Thank you for everyone. So point is housing is important to seniors to uh, benefit all the seniors too. Thank you. Thank you both. Questions? Again, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Moran.
Good morning. My name is Kevin Moran. I'm the Chief Financial Officer from Breaking Ground. And Breaking Ground supports this project for a number of reasons. Breaking Ground is a provider of social services um, to homeless individuals in New York City and also a developer of supportive housing in the city as well. So we see a number of benefits. I, I, I sympathize with Mr. Ho when he says that there are programs that they're providing are only 80% funded. We have that same problem. And so we, like CPC, have to go out and generate additional revenue to subsidize those mission critical programs and to further uh, provide the services that, that we are providing. So the rental income that they will earn um, from the ground lease and the, the rental expense that they will save on their office space are huge to their mission and what they will provide to the community. We also support the affordable housing. This is a very desirable neighborhood for seniors, and we see that as a huge benefit. And finally, we support the Gotham organization and the expertise that they bring to this project. David Pickett is a board member of Breaking Ground. We rely on him for his technical guidance and expertise on projects that we do. He's also a huge fundraiser for Breaking Ground and also helps us to further our mission and subsidize those mission critical programs that we run. So I have a letter from the CEO of Breaking Ground. Unfortunately, she could not be here today, but we are in support of this project. Thank you, questions. I wondered um, if you could follow up on your comment that this is a good neighborhood for seniors. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I think that, so in most of the projects that we're doing, they're in the outer boroughs and, and, and further from public transportation. This is a, in, within Manhattan, closer to public transportation, and so therefore that's what I base that on. Great, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monique Flores. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for, for all the help and support that you do for us. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of Jen Vallone, who was unable to attend today. Uh, she's the Associate of Executive Director of Youth Community and Arts and Advocacy for University Settlement. I am Associate Executive Director for Youth, Community, and Arts, um, but I'm also a neighbor. Um, so I, I've lived on Grand Street for 20 years now. So I'm also in support of this project. Um, University Settlement is the first and oldest settlement house in the country. As such, we are committed to providing community-based holistic programming to all members of the communities. We serve through programs aimed at the needs of very young children to older adults and all ages in between. Today, I would like to share our support for the Chinese American Planning Council Go Room Development Project, a project that will allow our CPC neighbors to expand and solidify their good work for our Lower East Side community by focusing on vital services to the neighborhood. CPC has been dedicated to the social and economic empowerment of the Lower East Side and Chinatown residents since its founding in 1965. The Go Boom project seems like a natural extension of CPC's mission with its focus on expanded inter intergenerational programming and services for the most in need, especially our elderly. A growing population that requires our collective and deep attention right now. For example, the development of the Go Pro Boom will allow CPC to provide a permanent home to many of their programs currently reliant on rental spaces and at the whim of market forces, including their social service programs, college counseling, adult literacy, and community health services, enhancing, expanding, expanding and consolidating such services in a permanent home for CPC is a win for our area. 
we know that the neighborhood is exhausted by the constant and disruptive development happening in the Lower East Side. We are also tired of that too. But it is more exhausting for so many of our vun vulnerable neighbors to be in stable, in instable housing or even homeless. The CPC Go Boom project will provide 488 new rental units, 43% of which will be permanently affordable and open to residents starting at 30% of AMI. The average is apartments, the average of apartments available to residents with income of 53 AMI, 100. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind Thank submitting the much. letter, we yes, would welcome definitely. having it in the testimony. Question. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Caitlin Andrews. Thank you. Hello, my name is Keelan Andrews. Unfortunately, I'm nursing a bit of a cold, so if I sound hesitant, it's not my conviction about my support of the project, I just have a cold. <laughs> um, Live on New York is a nonprofit membership organization representing 100 community-based organizations that provide services to older New Yorkers. These include the operation of senior centers, home-delivered meals, HUD 202 buildings, and other affordable opportunities for seniors across New York City. <clears throat> Live On is proud to support the Go Broom Development Project and our member of the Chinese American Planning Council in their endeavor to bring more affordable housing for seniors and community space to Manhattan's Community Board 3. In 2016, Live On New York found more than 200,000 older adults to be languishing on waiting lists for affordable senior housing throughout the HUD 202 program alone. The wait for a unit under this program averaged a jarring seven to 10 years. Additionally, there are currently an estimated 2,000 homeless older adults throughout New York City, and a recent study by the University of Pennsylvania found that this number was likely to triple to roughly 7,000 older adults by 2030 without significant intervention and investment. One of Live On New York's members recently completed construction on an affordable housing project in Queens. This project had less than 100 units and received more than 35,000 applications. This averages 522, unit, 522 applications for every unit that was developed. This is example is not unique to that one project. It plays out in communities across the five boroughs and highlights the significant housing crisis that we are in the midst of. Given this need, we are proud that CPC's proposal includes 115 new affordable homes for seniors. We know that this is no small feat and we recognize that this is, comes in conjunction with the rest of the project and we are proud of all that goes into making these units possible. We are excited to see the opportunity to see, for CPC to also gain new headquarters through this development. CPC is a long-standing, high-quality service provider in Manhattan, and there are so many older adults and individuals who I'm sure could testify to the important role that they've played in their lives. CPC goes above and beyond in support of the clients they represent, and bringing this new home to lower, the Lower East Side will only serve to solidify their impact for years to come. We one day look forward to sharing this opportunity to seniors throughout our membership and, of course, in the area to ensure that they can apply for this important opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Andrews. Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, I have a question um, about the proposed unit mix here. Not, I mean, you're not an expert on this particular project, but um, the notion here is that 70% of the units will be studios, 30% um, one bedrooms. Um, in your experience, what kinds of, how does that mix um, match the needs that you see in your population? Is there, how many of your clients are looking for housing that can accommodate a family member along with them? Sure, good question. And this is actually something that I've spent a lot of time looking to see if there's a study on best practices for when developers are looking to develop new um, buildings and are trying to determine the appropriate mix. I haven't found anything that specifically indicates whether the majority should be one bedroom or studios, but it's something that a lot of our members struggle in determining. Um, I will say there's a lot of uh, research out there that shows that the number of older adults, especially in the 85 plus population, which is the fastest growing demographic for seniors, are living a 
alone, and especially older women who are more likely to outlive men. Um, so just the demographics in itself lend itself to having a lot of individuals who might be better suited for a studio because they are living by themselves at that time in their lives. Um, and I do hear that the waiting list, so for some of our members who have HUD 202 buildings, an individual could choose to be on the waiting list for a one bedroom or the studio, and both, both options have significant waiting lists. There's not an overwhelming demand where we can't fill studio bedrooms at this time. Thank you. Other questions? Thank, Thank you. you for your testimony. Our next speaker is John Napisa. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is John DePiso with the Association for a Better New York. The Association for a Better New York is a nearly 50-year-old civic organization representing corporations, nonprofit organizations, education, cultural, health institutions, unions, and government authorities dedicated to promoting connections between the public and private sectors of New York City. We would like to express for the uh, we would like to express support for the proposal to develop and incorporate the remains of Beth Hammerdrash Hagadol Synagogue into a new mixed-use development that can continue to serve as a cultural center for the Lower East Side community. The tragedy of the 2017 fire of the Beth Hammerdrash Hagadol Synagogue represents a loss of part of the cultural history of the Lower East Side, and unfortunately, the subsequent structural integrity losses almost lead to the complete loss of the structure. However, the redevelopment plans proposed by the partnership between the uh, Chinese American Planning Council and the Gotham Organization, which incorporated remains of the structure into a new mixed-use building, emblem um, represents more than the architecture innovation and respect for the city's history. It is also emblematic the dynamic neighborhood and communities and creative adaptive reuses of our commun community facilities. Excuse me. We appreciate both CPC and Gotham's consideration of the existing structure, as well as the incorporation of a new congregation space and cultural her heritage center that will be accessible to the public. Additionally, we want to acknowledge the lengths to which both CPC sought and Gotham designed a mixed-use structure that is so explicitly intended to maxify, maximize affordability, using this development to address a concern repeatedly expressed by Lower East Side communities, including senior and Asian American immigrant communities specifically. We are pleased that this redevelopment project will enhance the critical, um, critical organization's ability to serve more than 60,000 individuals and families, as well as provide resources for communities across the city. ABNY fully supports the proposal for Go Broom, and we appreciate the testified this morning. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Federico Hernandez. Slip in for me. Um, okay, if you could wait until we'll get to you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Scott Short. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Scott Short. I'm the CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership. Riseboro is a 45-year-old nonprofit community development company based in Brooklyn. We specialize in developing affordable housing for our most vulnerable populations, especially senior citizens, and surrounding that housing with community services that empower people to improve their lives. We are currently partnered with the Gotham Organization on a large mi mixed-use project on the Long Island City waterfront that will bring nearly 850 permanently affordable apartments for senior citizens, formerly homeless, and a range of incomes as low as 30% of AMI. Through this experience, we have come to know Gotham as a highly competent, responsible, and civic-minded developer that shares Riseboro's commitment to using real estate projects as a catalyst for thriving communities. I testify in favor of Gotham and Chinese American Planning Council's Broom Street application today, not as someone who has any direct financial interest in the proposed development, but as a concerned citizen who wants to see the tools of our government used to promote equity and inclusion in our city. I believe that the project before you is the highest and best use of the site and will deliver an impressive range of community benefit including an inclusive mix of affordable housing and permanent homes for two critical community institutions. 
Projects like these are anchors that can help preserve the strength and diversity of our neighborhoods in times of change. It is these types of projects that government should be prioritizing and supporting to ensure the future of our city. Based on my belief in the merits of the proposed Broom Street project and my knowledge of the Gotham organization as a responsible civic-minded developer, I urge you to approve the application before you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? What is the other project that you had mentioned that you're teaming on, teaming up on? Uh, it's uh, the Hunters Point South project parcels F and G. Oh, Long Island okay. City. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. You. Our next speaker is Lillian Wu. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the Broom Street Development Project. My name is Lillian Wu, and I am with Hamilton Madison House as the Program Director of the Smith Senior Service Newark. Hamilton Madison House is a nonprofit settlement house established in 1898 to improve the quality of life for New York City. Located in Chinatown, Lower East Side, and the Two Bridges neighborhoods, we foster the well being of vulnerable pop populations, including the elderly, children, the ill, and handicapped refugees, and the unemployed. We have known and partnered with Chinese American Planning Council for years as a fellow so social service nonprofit in the Lower East Side. As fellow nonprofits, we fight side by side every day to provide social and economic empowerment to people throughout New York City. As many know, a key problem in our community is a lack of affordable housing, especially for the elderly. It is not only a problem for low income, seniors, but also middle-income seniors who age into poverty as a result of medical bills or other factors, including long-term unemployment or loss of a second income. Many seniors living alone spend more than half of their income on rent. As the population continues to age, more individuals are in need of affordable housing, but the waiting list for available units can be as long as 10 years. We must find opportunities to create affordable housing, and the Broom Street Project is a vital opportunity to provide desperately needed affordable housing for the elderly. We believe that by providing robust affordable housing and new homes to CPC and BHH Synagogue, the Broom Street Project will enable institutions with deep roots in our neighborhood to stay here and continue serving its people. As the Lower East Side changes rapidly, it is paramount to community-based organizations such as Hamilton Madison House and CPC to take an active role in the development in this neighborhood. As many of our peers have and will attest, this project is a welcome addition for the neighborhood. It is for all of these reasons that we are happy to be supporting the Broom Street Development Project. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Ms. Wu. Our next speaker is Barbara Davis. Thank you. <coughs> Hello and thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Davis. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Actors Fund. The Actors Fund is a human service organization founded in 1882, uh, serving everyone who works in performing arts and entertainment. Uh, we um, provide also a mix of social services, workforce development, affordable housing, and health care. Uh, the Actors Fund has partnered with Gotham on two of its recent developments, Gotham West, 1,238-unit uh, uh, residence in Hell's Kitchen, um, and Ashland, uh, 100, I'm sorry, <laughs> can't read with these glasses on, uh, a 586-unit development in downtown Brooklyn. Um, on each of these developments, the Actors Fund provided marketing services for the income-based units leading up to the building's lottery and lease-up. Throughout the process, Gotham collaborated closely with the Actors Fund to ensure the successful lease-up of the affordable units. Gotham exhibited a clear dedication to fostering an inclusive environment within its buildings and to execute its mission to provide high-quality, affordable housing to all New Yorkers. Uh, 
Uh, one of the services that the Actors Fund provides is also affordable housing education. We, we run weekly seminars uh, to people throughout the five boroughs on applying uh, for affordable housing. Uh, in particular, we also run a program called Howell Helps, which is a specific social service programs for artists and arts workers from the Lower East Side. Uh, Affordable housing has been the number one critical issue of these uh, individuals, particularly the seniors living in the Lower East Side community that we work with. Um, so we were very excited about the, the possibility, since there is such a high demand for this kind of housing in this community. Um, I, I, most of my other comments would be consistent with what you've heard from the other organizations in support, so I thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Otetiz. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Jessica Ortiz, and I've been a member of 32BJ for seven years. I am here tonight on behalf of my union and more than 5,032BJ members who live and work in Community District 3 <clears throat> to express our strong support of this project. The Gotham organization has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. We estimate that this rezoning will allow for the creation of 16 new property service jobs. These jobs are typically filled by the local members of the community, and because of this commitment, will pay family sustaining wages, which helps bring working families into the middle class. The Gotham Organization's partnership with the Chinese American Planning Council on this project will also help ensure that these jobs are filled by local community members. The CPC is fully equipped with job training programs and a career center that helps local employers recruit, hire, and retain local workers. It's not often that we see private development bringing people together as this project will. The development team comprised of the Gotham Organization, CPC, and BHH is truly representative of New York City's diversity, and we are happy to stand in support. The Gotham Organization has a track record of creating good jobs throughout their portfolio and a long-time partnership with 32BJ. We respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Paris Strotter. Hi, how you doing? I'm Paris Strutter representing the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm actually not here to speak. I just signed up in case there were questions for the agency. I think you're off the hook. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> our next speaker is Donald, Donald Hung. Hi, I'm Donald Hong. I'm president of 3D4 Grand Street, which is a nonprofit for affordable housing. We're on the small corner part of this large scale plan. Um, we had differences in the beginning, over six months to a year, we did work it out with Gotham and uh, CPC and with the help of Margaret HBD. The whole issue was how to maximize uh, affordable housing on this piece of land. And after a period of time, we did able to achieve this with the help of HPD. Um, my volunteering over the last 40, 50 years has been on senior citizen housing and low income housing. I am a private developer in New Jersey where I do it, where I develop real estate. But all my time, and even as a commissioner here in New York City, and I appreciate all your time and sacrifices that you give has been for affordable and low income housing. The, the, any, any additional money that we do have left over is dedicated to, to early childhood development that we do in the five boroughs here in New York City. But the most important thing that I found here was that the high percentage of affordable and senior citizen housing that we'll be able to provide for this project is the reason why we will be providing 15,000 square feet of air rights to this project. Um, 
we will be sacrificing our as of right to build. And if I was a private developer, from my own goals, from my own personal uh, goals, I would not go forward with this. But this property and our property, as well as CPC's property, is a nonprofit and it belongs to the community. So I support it because of the fact that we're able and we can contribute to part of building affordable housing, especially senior citizen housing. Now I live in um, <clears throat> right next to the High Line, and the answer is yes, I lost my view of the Hudson River. It was beautiful. But the amount of activity that changed that High Line area from a very quiet, desolate area to a thriving area, probably New York City's number one attraction. I mean, Essex Crossing and the Low Line has that potential to be the future New York City number one attraction. And I think with the right investments and taking care of our senior citizens and affordable and affordable housing people, I think that mix is the right mix that we have here today. So again, I thank everyone here for the chance of us being to participate in being part of that. And um, I do uh, not approve, I do support this project going through because of the senior citizen low income housing. We need to support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Hung. Commissioner Levin. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hung, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about 384 Grand Street, both the, the, the who owns it and, and, and what goes on in the building? We own it. We're 384 Grand Street uh, HDFC. You're an HDFC? Yeah. Yes, we're HDFC. We have quite, we have quite a few, quite a few uh, Section 8 housing uh, units in our building, senior citizen housing units in our building. Um, we're able to afford, and we do raise money privately. We don't get any other, other than the Section 8 funds, we do not get any other city or public funding. All our other funding is raised privately. And we are able to support our main goal, other than senior citizen housing and low-income housing, is early childhood development. Okay. And we're working, currently we're working with uh, the uh, Brooklyn Borough President on some major projects. Okay. So is your organization involved in other HDFCs? Uh, the answer is we would love to. We would love to continue. I was involved with CPC, with the Haunting. I served as president there for many, many years uh, on their, their housing, senior citizen housing. Um, I was involved with Chung Park. And I will continue because that is a mission that I volunteer for. Okay. Um, and then just to the physical, the footprint of the 384 Grand Street. Yes. Or the property that's owned by 384 Grand Street. Um, our materials indicate that there's some potential for additional retail development. Um, yes. So sort of wrapping around that building, what can you tell us more about that? Yes, what we're looking to do is, is part of this large scale plan is we will build a one story build out that goes around uh, with the R9. We'll be building a, a one, one story build out around where we have vacant land. To, buy, to provide some commercial space, and the commercial space funds our programs, our potential build, uh, additional build-outs. Okay. Any other questions? Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angela Howard. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, by way of background, my name is Angela Howard, and I'm the Vice President of Real Estate and Facilities for Covenant House International. Covenant House has been working <clears throat> with Gotham Organization, and I come here in support of the project from the perspective of a not-for-profit who has been partnered with Gotham on the development. Covenant House is the largest privately funded organization in the Americas, providing shelter, food, immediate crisis care, and a host of other services to homeless and runaway youth. We have been working with Gotham for nearly, I have been working with them for the past two years. Covenant House has had an, or, uh, an agreement with them for, for several years before that on the development of Covenant House's new international headquarters in Hell's Kitchen, a not-for-profit anchored development similar to the Gotham Broom Street Development pro Project. The Gotham team has been instrumental in the development of Covenant House's new 80,000 square foot facility, 
leading a highly complicated design in a thoughtful way and right now in the construction process. Throughout the past two years, all the members of the Gotham team have shown a deep commitment to the development of Covenant House's new facility, remaining involved with even the minutest details and ensuring that Covenant House receives the facility the organization deserves. The end result of the development will be the state-of-the-art turnkey community facility where Covenant House will provide expanded shelter housing, medical and mental health services, and educational and job training programming, among other services. In, in addition to overseeing the design, financing, and construction, Gotham has worked collaboratively with the community, illustrating their role as responsible and conscientious community stakeholders. From the perspective of a real estate project management and construction pre professional with over three decades of, exper of experience, I can confidently say that Gotham has gone above and beyond what has been required of them as the development, as the developer of Covenant House's new facility. Their dedication to this project is reflective of the firm's overall ethos, which is characterized by a deep commitment to development projects with large public benefits. Based on my experience with Gotham, I can confidently say that Gotham will work tirelessly to deliver best-in-class facilities to its nonprofit partners on the Broom Street development and create a great overall development. And I come in support of the project. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Howard? Thank you. Now, that is the last person who has signed up to testify. If anyone who has not yet spoken is interested in being heard on this topic, now would be the time to come forward. Okay, I will note that the record on this matter will remain open through Monday, the 16th of December of this year, to receive written comments on the draft environmental impact statement. And with that, the public hearing is closed. Manhattan, calendar number 14, concerning 503 Broadway. This hearing has been continued to December 18th. Bar of Queens, calendar number 15, CD7, C190320, ZSQ. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 18-17, 130th Street, Special College Point District. Our first speaker is Eric Palotnik. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. I hope everybody had a great holiday weekend and are easing back into it before the next holiday. Uh, we're here today, I think it should be relatively simple for you as a review goes. Uh, it, it is a land use action for a special permit uh, to modify sections 126 and 231, which is the front yard requirement, and section 232 of the Special College Point District. It's a special permit pursuant to 126.43 of the zoning resolution. Uh, to give you an idea of it, it's in the College Point area, of course. It used to be an urban renewal area back in the 70s. That urban renewal area expired in the late 90s. Uh, city planning then enacted the special College Point District to sort of mimic the urban renewal area. It sort of had its uh, its nuances, the, the quirkiest one being that it required all new buildings to have a setback in the front and the back. This property you're looking at, it's about 6,000 square feet. It's right behind where BJ's is and Toys R Us and where the airport used to be on 20th Avenue off the Whitestone Expressway. And uh, the shopping center's up there behind it. Uh, in any event, it's about 6,000 square feet, and it would be required to have a front yard of 10 feet, uh, two 10-foot side yards, and a front yard of 15 feet. I think the intent was to have it sort of be like a Long Island industrial park, and that all the new buildings would have big yards out front. Of course, the problem here, if you're looking at the aerial, is this is College Point. Uh, you're not on Long Island, and all the warehouses are 40 years old, and they all line up right up on the street. None of them have yards, none of landscaping, and it's not as bucolic, maybe, as if you go out to Hop Hog in Long Island or Melville, and you see all the industrial parks there with trees and plants. So that's what the special permit is sort of requiring us to do. We can't do that. We can, but we're asking for the special permit because it sets us back. And I'll take you through some more pictures here. It's the red building you're looking at here. The red and the, we're proposing to enlarge that onto the lot to the right, which you can see has the metal fence. So you see if we set that back and provide a 10-foot front yard, we'd look kind of funny compared to everybody else. And if we put side yards, we'd look funny also. Uh, this is what we want to build. It's for Pacific Lawn Sprinklers, by the way. They're in the lawn 
business. If we could provide yards, and, and if anybody could, they can. Uh, but we think it would be silly. It's a two-story contractor's establishment. They're gonna have their trucks downstairs, keep their landscaping equipment in there, uh, or their, their lawn sprinklers, and so forth and so on. This depicts to you the front yard requirement, which is the shaded area that would, would be required. We're asking you to waive, and uh, the side yard requirement that we're asking you to waive. And this just gives you more schematics of that. This shows you a section of the building at the bottom. You can see it's two stories at the front, but at the back, it's got 53 feet of just being one story. Again, it's just gonna have trucks downstairs, lawn equipment, and offices upstairs. That is our entire presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Committee Board 7 supported it unanimously. Questions from the Commission. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. Plotnick is the only person who has signed up to speak on this matter, but if there's anyone else present who wants to be heard, please come forward. The public hearing is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar number 16, CD7, C190029, ZMQ. A public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 147-40 15th Avenue commercial overlay rezoning. Our first speaker will be Jay Goldstein. Good morning, uh, Jay Goldstein for the applicants. Um, we're here on behalf of uh, 8850 Management LLC, the owners of the property located at 147-40 15th Avenue, which is lot eight in the uh, rezoning area. The proposal today is for a zoning map amendment to create a commercial overlay, a C12 overlay within the existing R3A district. As you can see, the proposed commercial overlay will be 100 feet from 140, running from 149th Street along 15th Road and 150 feet from 149th Street along 15th Avenue. Uh, my clients purchased in 2015 lot eight, which is the uh, northern part of the top part of the tax map that you see. In addition, there are three other lots that are included in this uh, rezoning area, lot 11, 12, and 14. The reason we're coming to you before, before you today for a rezoning as opposed to going for a variance um, just for our property is the history of the site is that uh, lot eight, 10, and seven were originally one lot in about 2007. 2007 they were subdivided and uh, by creating those subdivided lots, we believe it's self-created hardship and that it, by putting the legalization of the commercial use would also be a self-created hardship which would have precluded us from having a, uh, from going for a variance. So therefore we think that the C12, which is what the community board also um, expressed desire for in terms of a zoning district matches the density and the area which in, w within where we're located. Um, the predominant use in the area is community facilities, single family homes, and then there are uh, commercial overlays throughout running through the, running along the Cross Island Parkway, which is where, we're, where we are located. The four sites to be uh, developed, or not developed, but the four sites within the rezoning area are the development site, which is an existing uh, two-story building, which we're proposing just a change of use and no development. The mobile station, which is a grandfathered use, wouldn't be impacted or wouldn't be allowed to, to um, improve their site for the gas station. They'd have to go for an as-of-right commercial use or continue on under their BSA application. The two-family residential building, which is a brand new construction, wouldn't change, and the Jaeger House restaurant would be, a, it's a grandfathered use that we'd be legalizing as part of this. Um, here you can see an aerial view of the site. Again, those are the four sites. We believe that the uh, proposed use is within context. We don't anticipate any development as, as a result of this rezoning. It's specifically a mechanism which will allow my client that bought the uh, property in 2015 as an end user to legalize the use that they were under the impression they could have when they purchased the property. The history of the use of this development site is um, there's a there was a cabinet uh, making company, there was a child care facility, those were separate times, separate uses, I'm led to believe, and a paint shop at, at a certain point, or a, paint, uh, a painting center. So those were the history of uses. We took it over in 2015. So, so just to clarify, those uses are no longer present on the site? No, my client bought the building vacant in 2015. Um, he was under the impression based on those uses that it was a commercial building. He came to learn afterwards that it was not. We worked with DOB's padlock division um, to come through this process to legalize the use to try and help out a, an unfortunate situation. Thank you. Um, so your client, did your client purchase it 
and then subdivide it, or did your client purchase no, no, no. just the subdivided? So it was, the property was originally lot seven, was subdivided in 2007, I believe, by the previous owner. It was made into two houses <clears throat> and this two-story building. We purchased just the two-story building in 2015. It was already subdivided. It was already existing. We moved in, and then a couple, you know, a year it's later. Padlock on the door. Exactly. Right. Um, so let me ask you a rhetorical question. Um, I mean, not to imply any point of view I have about this. Um, you know, we're not normally in the business of um, approving actions that have been taken in violation of zoning. Um, apparently, sometime in the past, this building was converted. I guess it was never used for residential use, was it? No, I think okay. the conforming use that it was so used So sometime for in the past, um, DOB and some owner worked together to allow a building to be constructed here and occupied contrary to zoning. Why should we legalize it? I don't think DOB allowed it to be occupied contrary to zoning. I think it was built as a conforming, as a complying building for community facility use for the daycare oh, center. Oh, the daycare center. And okay. then at a certain point, the daycare center couldn't make it, I imagine. Um, went through the other commercial uses which were not permitted. We bought it under the assumption that the commercial uses or the representation that per commercial uses were permitted. As a result, we now have a property that we're using it as an end user, not as a, okay. an investor and we're trying to um, salvage what we can in an unfortunate situation. I see, so in your, in your situation it would have looked like, it looked like a grandfathered use at well, the time it was purchased. Right, it was presented to my clients who, they didn't have a zoning attorney at the time, they had a transactional attorney who wasn't familiar. It was presented on the CFO, there are offices listed. It's offices listed in conjunction, upon my review, offices listed in conjunction with a community facility use not, not a commercial office. A commercial okay. They didn't realize the distinction when they purchased the property. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Goldstein, could you provide any um, further information about the split community board vote? Sure. The community board vote, so with all community boards, a, a lot of times there's opposition to change, especially when you want to put commercial. So I, I expect that some of the votes were, um, you know, attributed to that. There was a speaker who came in opposition, one of the houses directly across 149th Street. He came in opposition um, under the impression that this was a large-scale rezoning that would allow for heavy commercial use along this strip that would impact his quiet at night and that would really change the face of the neighborhood. It's unfortunate he sat next to me actually without us knowing it, the entire community board, as we waited for our turn to speak. Had we spoke beforehand, I don't think he would have testified. After the fact, we test, we spoke, I introduced him to my clients, and we had a conversation about the impact of the rezoning and the changes. Um, he was very happy, or him and his wife were very happy with the application, had no problems, and they did not show up to the borough president's meeting. We actually presented on this community board um, pre-certification, we presented the application with notice because the community board thought we were actually certified. And then once we got certified, we, about a year later, with notice again, we presented at the land use and at the full board. So there was ample knowledge and ample um, presentation and, and notice. Other questions for Mr. Goldstein? Thank you. Thank you. The, next, Art, the, the other speaker is the owner. I don't think he, unless the board has specific questions for him, I don't think Questions? He, okay, then thank you. Those are the only folks who have signed up, but if anyone is interested in testifying, please come forward. The public hearing is closed. Thank you very much. Borough of Queens, calendar number 17 and 18, calendar number 17, CD1, C190267, ZMQ, calendar number 18, N190266, ZRQ, a public hearing in a matter of applications for zoning map and zoning tax amendments concerning 22-6046 street rezoning. We are going to have a presentation by the applicant team, a 10 minute presentation, and the team is comprised of Nora Martins Ackerman, Emmanuel Kokinakis, Hercules R. Greer, Bob Greenberg, and Malia Zaidi.
Good morning, Chair Lago, Commissioners. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure why the presentation. It takes a second. Oh, there we go. Okay. Nora Martins from Ackerman LLP on behalf of the co applicants for this land use application, Mega Realty Holding LLC, and the Pan Cyprian Association of America. I'm joined by Emmanuel Kokonakis and Hercules Argiriu from Mega Development, as well as um, Beth Greenberg and Malik Zaidi from Datner and Heim Rothkrug from Environmental Project Data Statements Company, um, who are available for the presentation and also for questions uh, that the commissioners may have subsequent to our presentation. We're here today to present the proposed rezoning of Block 769 in Astoria, Queens, which will make existing residential uses on the block uh, conforming and or complying and will facilitate the redevelopment of two underutilized sites that are not currently consistent with existing development on the block with a new mixed use residential development that includes affordable housing as well as a new home and theater for a the Pan Cyprian Association, a nonprofit community group that's been located in the area for decades. Just to orient you to the site, uh, the project area is comprised of an entire block. It's being rezoned, Block 769, bounded by Dittmar's Avenue to the north, 23rd Avenue to the south, 45th Street to the west, and 46th Street to the east. The existing uses in the area include the Pastilli Manor Building, which is a six-story, 70-foot tall uh, residential condo building that was uh, converted from the former Steinway um, Piano Factory and 2000 uh, approved uh, it was rezoned and approved in 2008. It's currently overbuilt in the existing R4 zoning district. The, um, the parking garage for the facility building is located adjacent, and then the two development sites, uh, one story ma manufacturing, originally built as manufacturing buildings, one was a plumbing establishment on 45th Street, uh, which is currently vacant. The plumbing uh, supply establishment has consolidated to other locations, and then a former contracting business, which was previously Mega's home, on 46th Street, which is now occupied month to month by two uh, contracting business subtenants um, that mainly use the site to park trucks. This is just the existing neighborhood context from uh, looking south, and you can see to the south of the development site are uh, existing non-conforming residential uh, one and two family homes. These are some photos of the development site. As you can see, there's currently no pedestrian experience, um, blank walls and very little activity in between the other residential uses that are currently on the block. You also have uh, across the street was a CubeSmart self-storage building that was built recently in the manufacturing zoning district. The area map here shows the proposed rezoning, uh, which would establish an R6A zoning district over the Pastilli Manor site and the proposed development site, uh, and then an R4 zoning district to the south to bring the existing one and two family homes into conformance. A C2 commercial overlay would also be established over a small portion of the block along 45th, which is across from the uh, Atlas Shopping Center across the street. This would allow for some commercial use on the 45th Street frontage of the development site and also um, allow for the commercial use that's located on the corner of 23rd and 45th, which is Joe's Garage Bar and Eating and Drinking Establishment to remain conforming and operational. Proposed zoning change map illustrates the proposed rezoning, which is the first action in this land use application that we're seeking approval of from the commission. Uh, which would be changing existing development, the existing zoning from the R4 and M11 to the R6A, R6A with the C2 overlay and the R4 zoning districts that I just discussed. In addition to the proposed rezoning, the application seeks to a uh, text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area um, in the R6A portion, uh, R6A proposed rezoning. The uh, MIH options that would be mapped would include MIH option two and the workforce housing option. The applicant is proposing to utilize the workforce housing option, which requires 30% of the residential floor area be provided an average of 115% of AMI. Um, no subsidy is permitted for this income restricted housing and the workforce option does sunset 
contain a sunset provision if not utilized within 10 years of establishment. Although and I just wanna briefly address the rationale for using the workforce housing option here, which is has not been employed widely in the city since it was created. The AMI for the medium household income in Community District 1 in Queens is approximately 62,000. However, um, Community District 1 in Queens does include five of the city's largest NYCHA housing developments. And the AMI for the census tract the project is located in has a median household income of approximately 70,000, which is high, uh, much higher AMI. And additionally, within the Steinway neighborhood tabulation area, which includes 17 census tracts, um, including the project site, nearly 60% of the population uh, has, have household incomes between 47,000 and 163,000, which is the broad range of incomes that this project's workforce housing affordable units would serve, as the project would have income bans at 70%, 90%, and 135% in order to achieve that maximum average of 115%. According to the US Census Bureau, 40% of households in Queens Community District 1 are rent burdened, spending 35% or more of their income on rent. The affordable housing crisis, as the commission well knows, doesn't just reach lowest income residents, which have received the bulk of the housing, affordable housing produced under the mandatory inclusionary housing plan, but also the middle class. The mayor's housing plan defines workforce housing as housing for those who provide essential services for the local economy, such as firefighters, teachers, nurses, or police officers, who may otherwise be priced out of the housing market in proximity to their place of employment. This middle class housing, this affordable middle class housing, therefore is essential to support our economy. In addition, the, one of the reasons the applicant selected the workforce housing option for this project is because market rents in the area reflect a moderate market condition. And that workforce option was, was established to address uh, policy concerns about potential effects of mandatory inclusionary housing requirements in areas such as the Steinway neighborhood where prevailing rents are sufficient to support construction at moderate rents needed by the middle class but not the internal cross subsidy of units affordable at low incomes. I'll now turn uh, the presentation over to Emmanuel Kokonakis who will discuss the proposed development and workforce housing uh, unit breakdown in more detail, as well as changes to the project since it was certified into public review. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as Nora mentioned, it is an existing through lot. We're proposing a total eight story. It's a six foot building with a setback with additional two floors, totaling 88 units. 28 will be permanently affordable uh, workforce housing as discussed. Um, building amenities include a fitness center, residence lodge, playroom, party room, office center, and landscape terraces, uh, roughly 6,000 square feet of uh, commercial space on 45th Street, Current, uh, currently contemplating a 70-spot parking garage and a 250-seat theater for the Pan Cyprian Association and Cultural Center, which would be the, the home of the organization. Uh, these are renderings from the 46th Street side of the building showing the existing um, homes to the right and the facility building to the, uh, to the left and the facility building to the right. This is the view from 45th Street. This is the landscape terrace in between the, the, the through lots on the second floor roof of the proposed development. And this is an aerial shot looking to the south. You could see the facility building in the lower right hand corner with the existing context. The Pan Cyprian Association has been an Astoria uh, based organization for over 40 years. Uh, they have many um, ministries and divisions that would utilize this space. They have a theater division, cultural division, dance division, and many athletic programs that could utilize the space, um, a choir division as well. Um, the space would be mostly used for practice and recitals um, on an ongoing weekly basis where uh, students and local residents would uh, come to the space to do practices and will be about quarterly, four to six, large performances on a given year. Um, the goal of the space is also to allow other local not-for-profit groups to rent the space on a short-term basis um, when not being used by the Pan Cyprian Association, so it'll be available for all local not-for-profit groups. These are some photos of the performances of the Pan Cyprian Association. 
Here's a further breakdown of the uh, affordability mix within the building. We have units at 70, 90, and 135% AMI. Um, okay. Questions for the applicant team. Commissioner Rob Prashad. Yes, uh, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, I noticed in the borough president's uh, response that we received here, it says the developer is going to sponsor a beautification and cleanup. Have the terms been set of how long this beautification will be in place? We haven't discussed uh, specific terms, but uh, along the Grand Central, there, there is a, uh, an overrun uh, area that we would uh, upkeep during the course of this, the ongoing life of this building. Okay. The other question was with regards to, I guess, city bike parking or city bike rack. Where exactly would that be proposed? On the so site? the building includes large setbacks. So we have a wide sidewalk, and we additionally set back an additional 10 feet. So you would look to do that within the, the setback area of the building. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, two things. First, um, I wanted to thank Ms. Martins for your detailed um, argument in favor of the workforce housing. That's obviously something that the community board and the borough president aren't too excited about and are pushing for um, lower income mix. Um, that's kind of beyond our mandate here. Um, I did just want to observe, though, in the letter that the applicant sent to the community board, one of the arguments in favor of the workforce housing is that it's going to help subsidize the theater. That's not the way um, inclusionary housing works. The whole point of inclusionary housing is to um, allow a subsidy of affordable housing, not a community facility use. So not a major deal, but just an observation that that argument um, doesn't have any legs with me. Um, but I'd like to ask you about the changes that you made in the um, unit mix in response to the community board. You're pretty significantly reducing the number of um, individual units by making them larger. Um, so first, I just want to confirm, that's not a change in the density of the project, right? You're just reconfiguring the same number of square feet? Yes. So the building stays the same shape that yes, was Yes, the square footage proposed. would be the same. Um, and then I want to, um, since our Commissioner Della Uz is not here, she had a question on Monday about the extent to which that mix of larger units, in fact, meets the needs of this neighborhood. Um, stressing the importance of basing a mix like that on actual data about what's going on in the neighborhood rather than um, anecdote about what people think might be required here. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, on that point, we'll be discussing with the department and providing a response to the commission after the hearing. Okay, good, thank you. And one item I do want to point out is the um, the family unit size, the two and three bedroom units, the majority of our affordable units will be two and three family units. So 17 of the 28 will be um, affordable uh, to family units with two and three bedrooms. So that allowed dual income households to fall within and qualify for that um, okay. unit mix. Okay, good. Yeah, but more information would be great. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant team? Thank you. We'll now continue with Thank the you. public hearing um, following our practice of having five speakers in opposition, five speakers in support until we exhaust all folks who would like to be heard with each speaker being able to speak for three minutes, beginning with Albert Rizzo. Good afternoon, uh, members of the City Planning Commission. I want to thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to speak here publicly. I have lived in this area of the project uh, for my entire life. I have seen the neighborhood change, sometimes not always for the better. It is my opinion that this project will hasten the decline of a once quiet residential neighborhood in Astoria. This project has no regard for the increased population and traffic brought on by adding 88 more apartment units which will house between 90 and 400 more residents in a two block area. Adding 10 more parking spaces as they propose to the, to the borough president does not solve the problem of traffic. This project has no regard for the increased number of children 
that will go to the already overpopulated schools in the area. No information has been provided that, as to where these children will go to school or what impact they will have on the schools in the area. The community theater that the developer publicly touts as a benefit to the community benefits only the Pan Cyprian Society and possibly some other private, small private groups that may choose to utilize it. It has been shown to benefit, it has not been shown rather, to benefit the entire community or the neighborhood as a whole, and in fact, will only increase traffic to the area. The so-called beautification attempts to clean up a small triangular area uh, of ground in front of the development, provide public Wi-Fi or arrange for uh, city bike racks to be installed, are not improvements that benefit the neighborhood as a whole, but are simply de minimis efforts to appease local politicians and perhaps this commission who have a say on the approval of the project. No environmental impact has been studied to account for the increased use of an already overtaxed public transportation system in the area or the impact on the utilities in the area by the increase of 90 to 400 additional residents. No consideration has been given to the local elected community leaders to the nearly 700 people neighbors in this surrounding area who have signed a petition opposing this project versus the very few who signed a petition in favor of the developer who don't live in the neighborhood and who in fact come from areas outside even the borough of Queens. There are alternative uses for this property. The area can be developed as one to three family homes that would be consistent with the surrounding neighborhood, would be consistent with an R4 zone, which is what most of the area is, um, and not this massive eight-story structure that will be dwarfing the surrounding homes in this area. And Thank you, Mr. Sorry, Rizzo. my time is up. If there are any if questions... If you would submit um, your written comment, we would welcome that. Great. And questions from the Commission? Thank you. Thank you. I will. Our next speaker is Marie Sarkezy. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Um, my name is Marie Sarkezy. I've lived in Astoria for most of my life. My home is located just a few short blocks from the proposed development site by Mega Construction. Um, the people that bought homes and live in the Upper Ditmars area of Astoria did not did so because it was a quiet residential neighborhood. This proposed project of two buildings eight stories high would completely destroy the character of our neighborhood and threaten our quiet residential area. This is not the reason we bought homes here, to look outside our windows and see tall buildings, for our streets to be congested with traffic, for our schools to be overpopulated, for it to be difficult for our families to park their cars. Our neighborhood was not built to accommodate the added volume, and we do not have adequate public transportation to accommodate the increased population and traffic. This project, as is, will have a tremendous negative impact in our community. The area around the proposed development site consists of one, two, and three family homes. These massive structures do not belong here. I urge you, please, to oppose this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker is Rodolfo Sarkezy. I thank you, uh, Chairman. I thank you, everybody on the board, to, to uh, listen to our concern for this project. Uh, I am Rudy Sarkezy, board member of Community Board One, and members are over the zoning committee for 20 years. A previous acting president of Astoria homeowner and tenant civic association for 23 years, an active member of the mini organization of Astoria community, and lifelong resident and homeowner of Astoria within block of the pro proposed project by mega construction. The community is strongly opposed to the proposed project of two buildings by mega construction on 45th and 46th Street in Astoria, and the rezoning of the area, which will consist of two massive structures, eight stores and 88 residential apartment units, 
and theater. This would lead a congestion all around the immediate area and behind the, the number of additional family, children, car, traffic, parking issue. It's not consistent with the, the surrounding uh, one two and three family home. If it would only change the character of the entire community, but would, would destroy the quiet residential area. We have ob obtained 700 seniors to the petition from owner and residents surrounding the area of project and the whole opposition to this project. We have uh, and we urge you, Chair Woman Logo, the member of the community to oppose the mega project will not benefit the city. The community of Queens absolutely benefit the residential suburban community of Astoria. The project only benefited the drove we stand to gain financially. We are hopeful the Euro risk process review uh, this application. We determine this project is not good for the city. It will not be a ne it will be a negative impact in our community. We would like to bring an attention to environmental assessment statement report on page, se page seven and page eight, in which it states that the propose proposed the project would not have a significant and adverse impact in the environmental of the neighborhood current. Holy uh, copy attached, this is false. The project would potentially have a tremendous negative impact in the community and change the neighborhood character forever. A better alternative would be build two or three homes in the lot. This is not, this is noted. Thank you, Mr. Sarkeesian. Would you be able to submit your written testimony for yes, the record? Sure. Thank you. And Thank questions, you. Commissioner Levin. Sarkeesian, it sounds like you've been a long time. Oh, sir. Sir. Could I ask a, Could I ask a question, please? Um, it, it sounds like you've been a long time observer and participant in, yes. in this neighborhood. So, my, I have a question for you about Castilli Manor. When it. Um, when that warehouse was converted um, in 2008, our information here says that it's a 201 unit condominium. What happened in the neighborhood? What's the, how, how have things changed with this? Uh, the building was built today on 1912. So it's mm -hmm. been there for a uh, standaway piano, they've been used there. And then the, the building was, when standaway piano moved a different location. And there was a stern warehouse they used for stern house for, uh, for a while, which is, you know, was not impacting the community. But then it was left uh, empty for many years. It was, uh, I mean, uh, I saw that. Then the building was sold, and we thought what they wanted to do actually, you know, put a low income apartment building there, which is doesn't fit with the community. We thought of that. It was a proposal to do senior assisting living. We went to the euro process there, which they approved to do senior assisting living. But the poor guy, he did die on one of the fresh, on the, I mean, plane crash there and he died. So the family didn't want to go with the bridge, the project, so they sold the project. Pistil brought to the building. When Pistil brought to the building, he came to the association and he says he was going to do condominium, which was not the case. So we had to go to court in order to have to stay there because we have the declaration of the zoning for that for 20 years, it can be changed for 20, for assisting a living and uh, seniors, which was approved on the community board and to the planning board and the commission of ETA. So then we had to go court with Stingleden in order to do the project there. They said, no, we're going to do condominium. We agreed to do the condominium because the people, it buys your own place. So it, in, in, you know, he is an employee, he's a good for the community because they own the own house. So we had to go to court in order to let it do that. So we won and they did condominium. It's, it's great, it's nothing, but this was existing. There's a new building there. If you see in the area, it's no other building, eight stories high. So, you know, this is really gonna destroy the, the if you see the, the area there, it's mostly three family, you know. 
we can talk with the other, see what else we can do with that. We, you know, we can work with them, and we don't want to do against anything, but we're open to see what we can work out. We'd be better for them, we can be better for the community, but this absolutely doesn't belong in the community. You can see the area there. You see this eight stories building. It's not like on Stanaway Street or 231st Street, which is, we rezone that area where it's feasible, but this is a residential. If you see uh, what's an article on the paper is the, the eight standards on the world to be the best places in the world, that's Toria. It's the residential, the people who live there, they have a family, they have kids, they have a church, they have a school, they're all private. And this is unacceptable. I mean, I've been in a community, I'm active, any, any community politician, doesn't matter what party they belong, you know, for Thank you, Mr. Sarkeza. So I appreciate what you can. A question from Vice yes, Chair Knuckles? Sure. No, that was the question I okay. wanted. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Padaras. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, thank you for letting me speak, first of all, and express my, my own personal view. As we all know, New York City is a vibrant city known for the skyscrapers, tree-lined neighborhoods, and communities. My neighborhood of our uh, Upper Didmars Astoria is an area of primarily one, two, and three family homes, <coughs> which is consistent with many other parts of the city and the auto borders as we know. Now, mega construction uh, wants to come in and change that. They want to change the zoning that's allowing them and consequently other builders to build mega structures of eight stories and more, thus changing the character and landscape of the whole area. As a long time uh, resident of Astoria, since 1966 actually, and as a homeowner of 1997, I have seen a lot of change in Astoria, a lot of changes. Uh, and many of those changes were great, and they are great. Change is a good thing. But in this particular case, it would be change that will set a precedent, thus allowing builders such as medical construction to change the character and feel of our community. I plead with you not to allow this to happen, at least not in its current form. And I would like for you to also consider that we are as a community willing to work with mega construction. I would love to have a community theater in our area. I think it's a great thing. But having an eight story building right basically in front of our backyards is unacceptable, is unacceptable. It will just change what the lady, the young lady before said, uh, said that we bought our homes with a certain value in mind, that it will, the neighborhood will be consistent, that we wouldn't have all these mega structures that we see around us, or else we could have moved in the city, bought an apartment, many people love that, that's great. But once we allow this to happen, then consequently it's going to bring other builders in the immediate area, buy those lots, and we will have all these buildings right in our backyards where you only see at the present time one, two, and three family homes primarily. So please, let us. Thank you, Mr. Padaris. <laughs> Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Luigi Farina. Good afternoon, Chairman Lago and committee members. My name is Luigi Farina. I'm the executive chairman of the Astoria Homeowners, Tenants and Business Associate, Civic Association. Uh, I'm also an Astoria homeowner, and for the past several months, we have been surveying and polling our members and community residents uh, their feelings around the project, and we found 99% of the people we polled are totally 
un un unacceptable to this community. Uh, for example, uh, we have obtained 700 signatures, we can leave today with you, who strongly oppose the project. And these are from community residents directly around the project. The project, as we heard, proposes two massive eyesore structures that are eight stories high and have 88 residential apartments for families. Furthermore, the first floor would be used commercial space and a live theater that would hold approximately 250 people. This would lead to additional congestion and parking problems in the area that they haven't addressed yet, other than saying we have some parking spaces in the neighborhood, in the, in the basement. Our community consists of one, two, and three family homes. This would stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, we talked about transportation before we have a question. The Ditmars Boulevard bus, which goes to 31st Street train station, is extremely overcrowded and extremely late sometimes because people are waiting for a half hour, an hour waiting for the bus. The 31st Street train station uh, is also presently overcrowded and it would be, this would add chaos to, to the uh, present situation. The only benefit to the project is the developers themselves. There, we don't, we see you know, no benefit to the community. So I personally urge uh, Chairman Lago and all the committee members to, per, to, to strongly object to this move because not only would it hurt us now, but in the future, if the zoning is changed, we don't have a chance to even have this process. I thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Farina? Thank you. Our next speaker will be Seamus Barry. Good afternoon. My name is Shay Barry, and I'm a doorman and have been a member of 32BJ for 28 years. I am here today on behalf of my union to share our support for this project. New York's economy is hard on working families, and we believe that in order to create a more balanced New York, New developments should come with commitments to create prevailing wage building service jobs. We are pleased to tell you that Mega Realty Holding has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage jobs to the future property service workers at this site. Additionally, we know this development to be a special development because it has a significant amount of multiple bedroom units. It is not often that a project like this goes through ULERP Having access to bigger and more spacious units means more space for growing families. 32BJ represents 4,500 workers who live and work in this community district. We believe that new development needs to cater to families at a range of affordability levels, including not only the lowest income families, but also moderate income people like many in our membership. We are supportive of a vision for this project that integrates workforce housing so that working people like doormen and porters can continue to have a place in this community and to live near where they work. We believe, <clears throat> we believe that this development team has a vision to invest in this community and we are happy to support this plan. We respectfully request you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Barry? <clears throat> Thank you. Our next speaker is Paola Duran. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Paola Duran. I'm the Director of Housing Development for HANAC. HANAC is a non-for-profit organization founded in 72 uh, in Astoria, and we provide a range of different programs and services, most of them in Queens. We own over 650 units of affordable housing in Queens, and we are the property management of, of over 600 units. HANAC is fully committed with the development of affordable housing, and we support any efforts towards that goal. That's the reason why HANAC will be working with the developer in order to act as the managing agent for the approximately 28 units of affordable housing presented on their proposal. HANAC's role will be to act as the marketing and management agent of the MIH units. HANA will be working towards the marketing process of the MIH units by developing the community outreach strategy that includes meeting with community organizations, community members, advertising on local media, sending letters to organ local organizations, informing them about the new housing opportunity this, this project will be creating. In addition, by working with city agencies to ensure 
All requirements are met by entering the applications into the Housing Connect portal, working with the lottery log, and interviewing potential tenants. HANAC manages a program that helps possible tenants to fill out the housing applications and submit them through the Housing Connect portal. Uh, HANAC is part of the Housing Ambassador, HPD's Housing Ambassador program as well, and it's the only non-for-profit organizations that it's uh, the Housing Ambassador in Astoria, so we really want to make sure that we work throughout the process with the possible tenants. Um, once tenants are selected, HANAC will be managing the MIH units of the project to make sure all requirements and compliances with the city agencies are reported on time. Um, over the years, HANAC has developed a network of community-based organizations, and this allows us to develop the right strategy for the marketing and rent-up of the proposed MIH units for this project. So we really support this application that will allow the development of the mandatory inclusionary housing units. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, Mr. Ann, with your experience uh, in the affordable housing world and particularly in this neighborhood, I'd like to ask you about two features of this um, project. The first is the um, applicant's intention to use the workforce housing program um, as opposed to perhaps option one. That's the one that community board would encourage us to require be applied here. Is that going to meet the neighborhood need as you understand it to be? Um, and also about the unit mix. They've um, reduced, reconfigured the building, as you know, so that there are um, fewer larger, um, fewer units, yes. but they were but are more family yes. size units. Uh, that too, does that meet the need um, of the, uh, the families needing affordable housing in this neighborhood, or would more smaller units um, better serve the affordable housing needs in the area? I think both of them go a little bit together, going with the workforce option plus the larger units. Uh, there is a need for more family units for the affordable levels. So what we have encountered, we mainly of our buildings are for seniors, so we also have sometimes issues with the smaller units. And every time that we have to go before the community board or the borough president, there is always the question about the larger units. So I think that's why the developer decided to really change the unit mix. And I think that it makes sense to have two and three bedrooms for the workforce uh, option, uh, because there is a real need in the community for larger units as well. So we always get some opposition uh, against doing larger, like more number of studios, against doing more twos and threes, especially if this is going to be for family housing and workforce housing. So that option will be covering uh, family, family units for, for those unit sizes. Okay, so, yes. so you're, you're confident you'll be able to find um, yes. income qualified even Families even when we're doing the, yes, even when we're doing the, going through the lottery process for senior housing, um, the requirements are very strict for senior housing, of course, in terms of the number of people, but sometimes they come with a larger, with grandchildren, more than one, so it's very hard to find larger units for them. So depending on, on the income level and, and if they meet the requirements, I think there is enough population on the area to fill up those units. Thank you. Commissioner Bernie. Hi, Paula. How are you doing? Good, and you? Okay. Um, I confess, I, I don't really know the difference in the requirements between the workforce housing option and the regular uh, housing option, so maybe you can teach me something? I think it's mainly about the income level uh, and the average income level. So I think with the workforce unit, with the workforce, and I don't know if you want to intervene, but for, my, uh, for options one and two, we can go up to an average of 80% AMI. I think for workforce unit, we can go a little bit higher. Oh, okay. I think that's that's one of the difference, right? But, that's but, but is the word, is it just about income or does the word workforce come into play as a definition? No, no, it's, it's, it's income, income level. Just income. It's based yep. on income, right. yes. Because, okay. I mean, there is a thing in other places where they have um, so-called worker priority housing for people like nurses and firefighters and so on who qualify for a specific program, yes. but that's not what we're talking about no. here. Mm -hmm. No, it's not like the Newark project that was for teachers, for right, school exactly. teachers. Exactly, yeah, yeah it's different yeah. and it's based on, on the income levels. Vice Chair Knuckles. I, I just wanted to respond further to Commissioner Bernie. I think an additional factor with uh, workforce is that you get no city subsidies. 
-hmm. the developer gets no city subsidies with workforce yes. as they do with uh, under options one and two. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Frank Scaretta. Okay, our next speaker is Philip Christopher. <clears throat> Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Philip Christopher. I'm president of the Pan-Cyprian Association of America, an organization that was founded in 1975. We currently have a community center on 2315 31st Street under the train station. Uh, three floors, 1,800 square feet per floor, and uh, we utilize that to service our uh, six divisions, the athletic, the cultural, the cultural being uh, the choir and our theater group and our dance group, uh, ma mainly made up of children, and of course all the other divisions, the women's division uh, that, that we have as well. We have approximately 2,000 members, 80% of them live in Astoria. So I want you to know one thing. If this project was not good for Astoria, we would be against it, regardless of the fact that the Pan-Cyprian Theater would be part of this structure. We would not be uh, proposing or assisting a proposal uh, that's not good for Astoria. Uh, I grew up in Astoria. I graduated at Bryan High School. I know the Astoria area. I urge you to go and see the area, first of all, over there, and see the Pistilli building on one side, the storage area of the, uh, of the cube, uh, smart cube uh, storage area, and see what the area looks like, and exactly what character are we trying to protect. So we do have a, uh, a building that's going to be there under mega construction, and of course the Pan-Cyprian Community Center will pay uh, to, uh, uh, to have this theater on an annual basis. And let me respond that we will service schools that require that type of theater. Uh, and uh, just along the line, so I heard here that uh, the schools are uh, overcrowded. I was, uh, I met with a principal of the school and, it's a, and they're worried about closing because they don't have enough children in the area. So this is uh, something that perhaps uh, can be investigated, maybe I'm wrong, but some of the teachers that we, uh, that are employed in that area, are concerned about the, uh, about the uh, amount of students in the area. So I'm here today to propose uh, or to advocate. Uh, it would be a great thing for the community to have a theater. Our group will make that theater available to any uh, group in the area. Astoria has changed a lot. You know, we have a lot of millennials, uh, people with bicycles that go from uh, cafes and to theaters. It's something that it's missing in the area. Uh, today we utilize Queen's Theater in uh, near, uh, near City Field. Uh, we utilize other, uh, other theaters whenever possible. But Astoria needs uh, this type of a theater and it's good for our association. And again, let me just close by saying that if this was not good for Astoria, we would be against it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Christopher. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about how you got connected to this project. How did Pennsylvania first encounter Mega, and what's the relationship here? Well, I've known Mega for a long time, and I think in their uh, other buildings, they often uh, put uh, things uh, that uh, service the community, and uh, they knew of the hardship that we're having uh, in terms of finding uh, appropriate space for theater, and they proposed it, and uh, we decided to partner up and try and help them. Uh, it's something that has to be now that took a long time to get uh, to get it voted from our members, because it would have a cost, a substantial cost to our association. Uh, that would uh, mean that we have to do fundraising to up, uh, to uh, upkeep the theater and to uh, continue to have it uh, to be a, a proper theater. But it's something that is needed, and uh, we have many children. We have to. We have 60 children in our dance groups. Uh, we have a 40-member choir. We have over 200 children participating in, in different events. So um, this is something that well, we needed. And we have been looking for something like this. 
uh, you know, uh, structures were next to our community center now. I've seen all these uh, big buildings coming across. When we bought the building on 2315 31st Street, uh, the zoning did not allow for uh, buildings next to us. Now our community center has tall buildings right next to us. One is a medical center, uh, and the other one is a, uh, a uh, I think it's a six floor uh, apartment building. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Cirillo. Just a quick question, and, and perhaps this was in the presentation, but it went past me. How many seats is the theater expected to have? 250. 250. Okay. The maximum. Maximum. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker will be Frost Otsuka. Hello. Uh, I am here as a member of the board of the uh, Greek Cultural Center in Astoria. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is, has been in Astoria since 1973. And uh, I myself am a resident of Astoria since 1968. And I have seen definitely the neighborhood and the whole area of Astoria change. Uh, especially in the last decade or so, there is a, a much faster change of Astoria. You see that in the streets. It's becoming more ma like Manhattan. Uh, it's, and there is a, an inflow of um, people for whom Manhattan is too, too expensive into Astoria. Uh, and what we see from our particular point of view as a cultural center is more and more artists coming into Astoria. Uh, we have a venue on uh, 30th uh, Street and uh, Newtown Avenue, and we have a small theater there of uh, 60 seats, and we have more and more people coming and asking for to use the theater, more and more groups coming and asking to use the theater lately. Um, we are up to about uh, half the year using it for people who are asking us for uh, space, and uh, the rest of the time we, we use it for ourselves. And we know there is demand for, um, for, for theaters, because there are no theaters in Astoria. The only theaters that exist are the theater of the, um, of the Frank Sinatra School of Art. Uh, ours is a small, very small theater, and there is another one that is called the Secret Theater, I believe, that has about 70 seats. And I, we welcome the existence of a, of, um, a new theater in, uh, in Astoria that will uh, benefit the community. We need to have theaters in our area so that we can have affordable culture for the people. Uh, we, it, it's not, um, that, that's part of the, of the needs of the people of the area, to have culture in their area, to have accessibility to, to places of culture. And um, uh, right now, we, we also have to go either to Queen's uh, Theater, which is uh, in Corona, to find a bigger space, even for our own um, uh, events that need more more seats than the ones we have, and also the um, uh, the Frank Sinatra Theater, we go, or we have to go to Manhattan to find uh, space for our uh, for our shows. Um, so uh, that, that's the main point I want to, to make for the need of theaters in, uh, in, our, in our area. And uh, the, the other thing I want to mention, though it's not my, my area of, uh, of uh, real interest, but he, he, as a resident of Astoria, um, I'm glad to see more. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question, would you know what the capacity is of the Frank Sinatra Theater? Uh, it's uh, 400 around there. Usually we go, yeah. Okay. Other it's questions? It's bigger than this. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Attilio Vidinich. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, May the company uh, painted a beautiful picture. But unfortunately, my name is too long. Uh, please allow me to speak and express myself. My name is Athelio Friedenich. I live uh, 2227 49th Street, Astoria, three small blocks away from this project. Uh, Astoria happened to be a residential area. 
with one or two different, one or two family houses. And it's already congested. There is no more parking, too many people. And if uh, Mega wants to build 84 units, eight floor story, I would support if they would only build three family house. That would be wonderful, but not 84 units. Uh, uh, what is it? Um, I oppose this project on 49th Street. I live on 49th Street and the uh, cars are too many speeding just to speed, just to, just to be the light to go over the Grand Central Parkway. People already cannot get out the driveways because too many automobiles. I would just hope that you support my, my opposition to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vidinich. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Our next speaker is Emidio Biasella. He okay, want to speak. Um, those are the only people who have signed up to speak. If there is anyone else present who hasn't yet spoken and would like to speak, please come forward now. The public hearing is closed. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 19, CD3, C180308, ZSR. A public hearing in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 2835 and 2845 Veterans Road West. Our speaker will be Philip Rampola. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Phil Rampula here. I don't have a presentation to make, but if there are any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Rampula. Commissioner Cirillo. Just, just, hi, Philip. How Hello, are you? Commissioner. Just a couple of questions. Uh, there's no presentation, so. Just want to make sure, and I, I realize that there's uh, obviously uh, support for this project out on the island, looking at both the community board and the borough president's recommendations. Um, but just a, a couple questions. So I guess one has to do with the, the status of the discussions with DEC. Yes. Um, could you just update us on sure. what those are given the So the, there, there is a, um, a stream card uh, in the right of way of the Korean War Veterans Highway. And because it's a stream card and it's been um, uh, labeled a, a freshwater wetland, the 100 foot adjacent area line comes onto a portion of our property in the back. Yes. So the DEC has reviewed our application. They're satisfied with their application but they require a CE, an SEQR, a seeker, a state seeker. Yep. They don't have the ability to um, do the traffic component of the state seeker, so they're relying on the city seeker. So once this application is approved, if it's approved, uh, the seeker determination will be sent to the DEC, and then they will issue the DEC freshwater wetland permit. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that. Just, so two other quick questions, just in looking at sort of the site plan. Mm -hmm. Understanding that the, the f we'll call it the front, is on Veterans Road, Road West. Correct. And, but the buildings are set to the rear of the site, right? So the, sort of like a boomerang style to the property and the street. I call it pistol shaped. Pistol shaped, okay. How far back is it going? It's not clear from the paperwork. What is there some, is there natural area then behind? Is that where the wetlands are? No, that's the, that's the right of way of the, um, of the parkway behind. That, it goes right to the, okay. Correct, and, and a, it, mapped around the perimeter of our site is a two foot park strip. Yes, that I saw. So, so, they, so we cannot have access to that area. 
and they only left a 40 foot wide opening okay. on Veterans Road West to access our site. Yes, I see. So okay. that yeah, wooded see. area will stay wooded and Good. undisturbed because it's part of the parkway right of way. Great. And I guess one other question had to do with the below grade parking. parking. We're working, we're working with, there's a 30 foot um, topographical change from Veterans Road West dropping down to the expressway. Sure. So instead of trucking in a lot of fill, uh, we are proposing that the building be set back as much as we can so that it creates natural parking down and under. Great. And do they, is it envisioned that the parking would just be, because um, it said it was about 40, about 40 spots about 40 underground? Spots. Would they be parking, uh, would it be attendant parking or just people would come in and? It'd be people, just people who come in and most likely it'll be used by employees. That's how I'm, I'm saying. Okay. It. Okay. And is, and it's again, not easy to tell on, on the materials we have, but is it a, a walk up parking from the parking, or would there be an access it's, point it's, through? There's a, a walk, uh, two stairs and an elevator to get from that level up to the first floor to grade. And you would get up to grade into the into the center. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Knuckles. Yeah, just uh, an observation, and and uh, I was wondering about your response. You're building. Uh, almost 100,000 square feet of, of commercial and retail space, uh, presumably on spec. Do you, do you have any uh, uh, tenants at this point? Are you optimistic about, obviously you must be, but uh, I was but just wondering what the status is at this there, point. There has been a lot of interest from um, larger retailers such as um, Staples. Um, no one has signed a commitment. I don't know if the commission was aware, but we were, we were hung up in, uh, um, DOT review for almost a year, and we had to uh, get through that. And um, there, the tenants are the po the potential tenants are unsure of when this was going to be approved, so we don't have any firm commitments. Commissioner Bernie, um, we don't have the presentation up, and you may not be the right person to answer this. But in the review session, I was somewhat disappointed by the architectural expression of the project, and I was hoping to have seen a more contemporary expression. I don't know what room there is I, to I agree with that. you wholeheartedly, Commissioner. Um, our firm didn't design the, the actual center. <laughs> okay. I'd like to go on record for that. Um, we have been talking to the owners as we're taking a more active role besides just the land use, and they are amenable to redesigning uh, what that building will eventually look like. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Rampola. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alex Lieber. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Lieber. I'm with AKRF. We're the environmental consultant for the applicant uh, for this application. Uh, we prepared the EAS, and I'm uh, here just to answer any questions you might have uh, about the EAS. I will also mention that my colleague, uh, Matt Carmody, also from AKRF, uh, is here in case there are any questions specifically about the transportation analysis and the traffic analysis. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Carmody? I was just going to say, um, it's too bad he got hung up for a year at DOT. That seems uh, more, what do they say, cruel and unreasonable punishment. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Dane Warren. Good morning, or afternoon now. Uh, my name is Dane Warren. I'm with the law firm Sive Paget and Rozell, and I'm here on behalf of Imba Highland LLC and Anthony Vasaturo, who is a local business owner in Staten Island, um, and we're speaking in opposition to the development application. Simply put, the commission lacks jurisdiction over this application. The tax lot on which this application is based was unlawfully formed. The applicant here filed a fraudulent owner's authorization to DCP and CPC, which resulted in the unlawful subdivision of two tax lots, tax lot 170 and tax lot 150. My client is the owner of tax lot 170. And then that unlawful subdivision 
resulted in the enlargement and consolidation of other zoning lots that now form the basis for this application. Because the tax lot on which this application is based does not lawfully exist, this commission does not have jurisdiction to consider the development application that's currently before you. I feel compelled to let you know that this application and this issue is currently the subject of ongoing litigation in Richmond County. We've moved for a preliminary injunction in that case. The matter is fully briefed and currently pending before the court. We hope to be able to have a decision as soon as possible. I also feel compelled to tell you that the applicant in that case has offered no evidence whatsoever disputing the allegation that they filed a fraudulent owner's authorization that resulted in the subdivision. They've offered no evidence to dispute that allegation. They've offered no rebuttal whatsoever of that claim. In short, we don't seek to unreasonably delay the application or speak to the merits of the proposal in general. But until this issue is resolved, the commission should not be hearing this application. We would ask that the commission terminate the public hearing and dismiss the application, or at the very least, adjourn this hearing until the matter is resolved in Richmond County Supreme Court. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are the only folks who have signed up to speak on this matter. If there's anyone else who has not yet spoken who would like to, please come forward. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Raymond Masucci. I am one of the partners uh, as a developer here on this particular project. I would just like to say one thing that uh, the gentleman that just spoke on behalf of the civil matter that is currently being litigated is correct. It is a civil matter. And there was a preliminary injunction that was filed and the preliminary injunction was denied. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else who would want to be heard? Then the public hearing is closed. And Madam Secretary, any other business before us? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Meeting is over. Okay. One. Who's the licensed judge? That's what I. Do you know? We just like to keep it. You know what? Why do we put us at the end? I'm gonna fix this up. I'm thinking of pulling the door.